Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I first would like to remind everyone to please mute your line when you're not speaking. And uh, for media and press, the FDA press contact is Audra Harrison. Her email and phone number are being displayed, as you can see now on the screen. <laughs> My name is Kenneth Morris, and I'll be chairing this meeting. Uh, I'll now call the second day of the November 3rd, 2022 Pharmaceutical Science and Clinical Pharmacology Advisory Committee meeting to order. Rhea Batt is the acting designated federal officer for this meeting, and uh, we'll begin with introductions. Rhea? Thank you, Dr. Morris. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rhea Batt, and I'm the designated federal officer for this meeting. When I call your name, please introduce yourself by stating your name and affiliation. We'll begin with standing PSCP members, starting with Dr. Carrico. Good morning, this is Jeff Carrico. I'm with uh, the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Feinstone. Yes, good morning, Sandra Feinstone, consumer representative. Thank you, Dr. Feinstone. Next, Dr. Kagan. Good morning, everyone. This is Leonid Kagan, Rutgers University. Thank you. Dr. Kraft. I'm Walter Kraft of Thomas Jefferson University. Thank you. Next, Dr. Lee. This is Kelvin Lee from the University of Delaware. Thank you. Dr. Morris. This is Kenneth Morris, uh, Professor Emeritus from the University of Hawaii at Hilo. Thank you. Dr. Richmond. Hi, this is Frances Richmond from the University of Southern California. Thank you. Dr. Zamboni. Uh, Bill Zamboni, University of North Carolina. Thank you. Next, Dr. Flood. This is Eric Flood of the U.S. Census Bureau and University of Maryland. Thank you, Dr. Flood. Next, we have our industry representative, starting with Dr. Rogi. Good morning. Uh, this is Mark Rogi. I'm with Sail Bio in the University of Florida. Thank you. Mr. Rogi. Mr. Rohde, could you please unmute yourself and introduce yourself to the committee? Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, myself, Praveen Rohde, industry representative, working with no artists. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Venkateshwar? Hi, this is T.G. Venkateshwaran. I'm with Takeda. Thank you. Next, we'll move on to temporary voting members. Dr. Amadon. Greg Amadon, University of Michigan. Thank you, Dr. Amadon. Next, we have Dr. Donovan. Good morning. Maureen Donovan from the University of Iowa. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Hancock. Good morning, William Hancock, Northeastern University. Thank you. And next, Dr. Lai. Uh, good morning, this is Tony Lee from uh, Purdue University. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Next, we'll move on to our FDA participants. First, we have Dr. Lee. Hi, uh, this is uh, Sao Larry Lee. I am the Deputy Director of Science from the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Next, Dr. Yu. Good morning. This is Dr. Long Xu, Director of Usual Products. Thank you. Dr. Sinantidis. Good morning, Stadius Sinantidis, 
uh, Director Office of Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Assessment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wu. Good morning, this is Larissa Wu. I'm the Associate Director for Science and Communication in the Office of New Drug Products in OPQC. Thank you, Dr. Bra. Um, hello, I'm Dr. Ra, and I'm the Associate Director for Science and Communication in the Office of Life Cycle Drug Products in the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. Thank you, Dr. Ra. Next, we have Dr. Shah. Hi, this is Rakhi Shah. I am Associate Director of uh, uh, Science and Communication in Office of Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Assessment, OPQ Cedar. Thank you. And Dr. Welch. Good morning. I'm Joel Welch, the Associate Director for Science and Biosimilar Strategy in the Office of Biotechnology Products in OPQ, also in CEDAR. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Welch. That concludes panel and FDA introductions. Over to you, Dr. Morris. Thank you, Rhea. A uh, statement to be uh, read now is, uh, is the following. For topics uh, such as those being discussed at this meeting, there are often a variety of opinions, some of which are quite strongly held. Our goal is that this meeting will be a fair and open forum for discussion of these issues and that individuals can express their views without interruption. Uh, thus, as a general reminder, individuals will be allowed to speak into the record only if recognized by the chairperson. Uh, we'll look forward to a very exciting and productive meeting. In the spirit of federal advisory, the Federal Advisory Committee Act and the Government in the Sunshine Act, we ask that the advisory committee members take care that their conversations about the topic at hand take place in the open forum of the meeting. We're aware that members of the media are, are anxious to speak with uh, FDA about the proceedings. Uh, however, FDA will refrain from discussing the details of this meeting with the media until its conclusion. Also, the committee is reminded to please refrain from discussing the meeting topics, topic or topics during uh, breaks or lunch. Uh, thank you. And now, uh, Rhea Bat will read the conflict of interest statement for the meeting. Uh, over to you. Thanks, Dr. Morris. The Food and Drug Administration is convening today's meeting of the Pharmaceutical Science and Clinical Pharmacology Advisory Committee under the authority of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, FACA, of 1972. With the exception of the industry representatives, all members and temporary voting members of the committee are special government employees or regular federal employees from other agencies and are subject to federal conflict of interest laws and regulations. The following information on the status of this committee's compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws are covered by, but not limited to, those found at 18 U.S.C. Section 208 is being provided to participants in today's meeting and to the public. FDA has determined that members and temporary voting members of this committee are in compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws. Under 18 U.S.C. Section 208, Congress has authorized FDA to grant waivers to special government employees and regular federal employees who have potential financial conflicts when it is determined that the agency's need for special government employee services outweighs his or her potential financial conflict of interest or when the interest of a regular federal employee is not so substantial as to be deemed likely if, to affect the integrity of the services which the government may expect from the employee. Related to the discussions of today's meeting, members and temporary voting members of this committee have been screened for potential financial conflicts of interest of their own, as well as those imputed to the 18 U.S.C. Section 208, their employers. These interests may include investments, consulting, expert witness testimony, contracts, grants, CRADAs, teaching, speaking, writing, patents and royalties, and primary employment. Today, as part of the continued effort to provide key updates on modernization of quality assessment, the committee will discuss the next stages of knowledge-aided assessment and structured application, CASA. 
The concept of CASA was envisioned in 2016 and discussed at the Pharmaceutical Science and Clinical Pharmacology Advisory Committee on September 20th, 2018 as an IT system that modernizes FDA's assessment. Through the development, testing, and implementation of various CASA prototypes, the CASA system has been refined over the course of multiple years. FDA will seek input on the vision and plan to expand CASA over the next five years to include drug substances, all generic dosage forms, new drug and biologics applications, and post-approval changes. Moreover, FDA will seek input regarding the need for advancing digitalization in CASA, including data standardization and mobilization of data from cloud-based servers. This is a particular matters meeting during which general issues will be discussed. Based on the agenda for today's meeting and all financial interests reported by the committee members and temporary voting members, no conflict of interest waivers have been issued in connection with this meeting. To ensure transparency, we encourage all standing, member, standing committee members and temporary voting members to disclose any public statements they have made concerning the topic at issue. With respect to FDA's invited industry representatives, we would like to disclose that Drs. Mark Rogi, Praveen Rodi, and T.G. Venkateshwaran are participating in this meeting as non-voting industry representatives, acting on behalf of regulated industry. Drs. Rogi, Rodi, and Venkateshwaran's role at the meeting is to represent industry in general and not any particular company. Dr. Rogi is employed by SailBio, Dr. Rodi is employed by Novartis, and Dr. Venkateshwaran is employed by Takeda. We would like to remind members and temporary voting members that if the discussions involve any other topics not related on the agenda for which an FDA participant has personal or imputed financial interest, the participants need to exclude themselves from such involvement and their exclusion will be noted for the record. FDA encourages all other participants to advise the committee of any financial relationships that they may have regarding the topic that could be affected by the committee's discussion. Thank you. Dr. Moore? Thank you, Ria. At this point, we'll proceed with the FDA presentations, beginning with introductory remarks from Dr. Larry Lee. Dr. Lee? Thank you. So, good morning. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm going to kick off uh, the second day of this advisory meeting by talking about the vision and roadmap to advance our quality assessment. First, it is important to talk about the importance of pharmaceutical quality. In general, a quality product means that it consistently meets the expectations of the user. Drugs are no different. To understand the importance of pharmaceutical quality, it is necessary to relate pharmaceutical quality to patients' perspective. Specifically, patients like you and me expect safe, specifically, patients like you and me expect safe and effective medicine with every dose they take. Pharmaceutical quality is consistently meeting standards that ensure every dose is safe and effective, free of contamination and defects. It is what gives patients confidence in their next dose of medicine. The Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, uh, the so-called OPQ within CEDA, oversees the quality of many drug products, including new drugs, generic drugs, biologics, biosimilars, and over-the-counter drugs. All of drug applications have a quality or the so-called chemistry manufacturing controls CMC session. One of the core functions of this office, OPQ, is to assess this session of all the drug applications. Specifically, our assessors evaluate how product is designed, how it is manufactured, and the manufacturing facilities to ensure a safe and effective drug 
is being delivered consistently to the intent patient population. OPQ also assess product and manufacturing changes after a drug is approved as part of a continuous improvement to ensure quality is maintained. Although there have been noticeable improvements in the drug development and manufacturing arena, regulators like us are still facing challenges in assessing quality information in drug applications. The number and the complexity of the applications have increased dramatically in the last few years. And at the same time, we are tasked to evaluate these applications in a shorter time frame with a similar resources. Let me just give you some idea. Every year at OPQ, we evaluate on average more than 3,000 INDs, more than 200 new drugs and biological uh, applications, more than 900 generic applications, and more than 10,000 post-approval changes submissions. And one problem is we receive all this information as unstructured information in PDF, uh, PDF files. As a result, our assessments are freestyle, unstructured narratives in which a significant portion of the documents are pretty much summarization of information or copy and paste data from the submissions. Such a system or approach can pose problems because the risk assessment and evaluation of the applicant's uh, mitigation uh, approach gets dispersed in lengthy uh, narratives. Oftentimes, there, is, uh, there can be inconsistencies and ineffectiveness and encumbered ability to share knowledge and efficiently manage FDA's respiratory of approved drug products and facilities. Our decision-making capacities may not be optimized because assessors evaluate each, info, uh, each application or the information in each application in relative isolation without fully assessing the wealth of information at FDA's disposal. We should realize that good knowledge management is really essential. In the context of technology advancement, we cannot continue to assess qualities through our traditional narrative-based uh, evaluations using unstructured test summarization of application information and copy and paste data tables. I would like to point out that these practices do not allow for easy knowledge sharing, management of quality across product life cycle, and overall modernization of assessment. Instead, in order to be most efficient, we want to take advantage of modern uh, information technology tools and platforms that emphasize structured data and the ability to capture critical information. This will then move to highly specific, stored in a predefined format structured data, which will enable us to achieve a systematic approach to risk assessment, resulting in a much more consistent, high-quality evaluation and decision-making. The idea here is based on efficient information exchange, knowledge management, and data analytics. At OPQ, we recognize the need to modernize our quality regulatory assessment, and we are currently taking steps to transform our evaluation from narrative information to more structured data and systematic approach for risk assessment powered by information technology so we can best capture and manage knowledge. 
This concept was envisioned in 2016 and discussed at the Pharmaceutical Science and Clinical Pharmacology Advisory Committee meeting on September 20th, 2018. As CASA, an IT system that modernized FDA assessment. As part of assessment modernization effort, we created CASA, a knowledge management system meant to modernize the assessment of drug applications. CASA stands for Knowledge Aim Assessment and Structure Application, which is really a, uh, the IT platform internal to FDA. It is a database platform for structure, quality assessment, and applications that support knowledge management. We already have a fundamental knowledge base of the products, manufacturing processes, and facilities. As new information comes to us in application, we want to be able to assess that information in conjunction with our existing knowledge and achieve knowledge management throughout the life cycle of the drug product we evaluate. Biocancer is a key driver to fully achieve our vision of advancing quality assessment powered by IT and multidisciplinary approaches. We must integrate CASA with other key OPQ initiatives or program. And I'm going to briefly describe here, although the focus of this advisory committee is on CASA. These initiatives and programs include QFD, IQA, M4Q, and PQCMC, and in the next few slides, I will highlight what they are and explain how they relate or connect to CASA to provide a comprehensive framework or approach enabling more effective and efficient quality assessment. CASA, a focus of this AC uh, meeting, is a system that takes advantage of IT technology and innovation to modernize regulatory submission, assessment, and registration using structured data advanced analytics, and knowledge management. CASA capture and manage knowledge, incorporates rules and algorithms for risk assessments, and enables assessors to perform advanced analytics, resulting in a comprehensive and science risk-based structure assessment. To maximize the benefit of CASA, we will need information and data that are well structured and organized. This is where ICH, M4Q, and PQ, CMC comes to play. ICH, M4Q is currently under revision. It will reflect advancements in technology and regulatory approaches, so it can continue to provide harmonized guidelines or guidance on the content and organization of the quality information in an application across regulatory agencies. CASA will use information from M4Q for quality assessment to really facilitate approval and life cycle management and accelerate patient and consumer access to critical medicines. For CASA to effectively use information from M4Q, we need PQCMC, which stands for Pharmaceutical Quality, Chemistry, Manufacturing, and Controls. PQCMC is still under development. It provides standard data elements and data exchange standards to the industry. So the future submission will contain structured quality information to be used by the CASA system. 
it is a critical enabler for M4Q implementation and long-term effective knowledge management. Therefore, to enable an effective and efficient um, quality assessment and fully take advantage of CASA, we need an application that incorporates both organization as defined by M4Q and data standards as defined by PQCMC. To assure seamless integration of all the relevant quality disciplines in assessment of applications using CASA, we have integrated quality assessment teams and processes. In this context, the assessment is done by a multidisciplinary team following a defined business process with a clear roles and responsibilities. And this figure shows the relationship of integrated quality assessment with respect to CASA, M4Q, and PQCMC. An assessment of a approved product should leverage relevant information available about the product and how and where it will be made. Quality surveillance dashboard and another IT system, the so-called QSD, will augment CASA and allow us to use current and historical information about both the facilities as well as the applicants in one place. Together with the information from the application, using these IT platforms, we will be able to conduct a comprehensive assessment of the application by considering all relevant risks. I want to emphasize that using these advanced tools or systems are expected to enable us to do our quality assessment more effectively and efficiently by applying the same quality standards. Let me just emphasize one more time. We are going to apply the same quality standards regarding, regardless using this IT platform or using the traditional way we do it. At the same time, using these IT platforms will really help us to improve the consistency of our quality assessment. Among these tools, CASA certainly plays an important role in ensuring the quality and consistency of our assessment. In this context, some key features of CASA worthwhile highlighting here are captures and manage knowledge across life cycle of a product, has built in rules, algorithms, and analysis to inform regulatory decision making, focuses on structural regulatory quality assessment, and provides data integration with other FDA systems. My colleagues will elaborate more about these key features of CASA in their presentation later today. OPQ is focused on continuing CASA's development following the release of CASA for generic solid oral dosage forms. Our vision over the next five years includes expanding CASA to just substance, including DMFs, new and generic applications, all generic dosage forms, INDs, new drugs, and biologic applications, as well as post-approval changes. And in conclusion, CASA is one of the approach we are working on to drive innovation in our quality assessments. Uh, by utilizing 21st century information technology. I would like to thank our OPQ and CEDA staff, um, as well as CEDA leadership for their support of CASA development 
and implementation. And thank you. And next, I would like to introduce the next speaker, Andre Wall, to talk about and summarize our CAPSA accomplishments today. Thank you. Hello. I hope everybody can hear me well. So um, I want to thank the organizers of the Pharmaceutical Science and Clinical Pharmacology Advisory Committee meeting to discuss the accomplishments of CASA today especially in the context of the ANDA program and as a prelude to its extension to both the NDA and BLA programs. But before I proceed, it is important to explain why we set out to develop the CASA system. We do this because historically assessments have relied heavily upon freestyle narrative text, consisting of unstructured information, summarization of application information, and copy and paste of data from the sponsor. And from our perspective, this system covered our ability to share and manage our knowledge within FDA's repertoire of approved drug products and facilities. It also hindered our decision-making capabilities as assessors evaluated each application in relative isolation without fully assessing the wealth of information at FDA's disposal. And due to these limitations of our traditional narrative assessment, as early as 2016, a CASA-type system was envisioned as a means of modernizing FDA's assessment. So we envisioned a system that would utilize structured data as opposed to freestyle narrative to develop advanced analytics to enable knowledge management of our repertoire of drug products and facilities. And so over the course of six years, Subject matter experts at various levels developed, tested, implemented, and refined various homegrown structured assessment prototypes as a prelude to our CASA system. And taking these learnings from these various um, prototypes and working with the um, office working with our colleagues in the Office of Business Informatics, the Office of Strategic Programs, the Office of Information and Management Technology. All these efforts culminated in the launch of CASA in the FDA's Nex Nexus IT platform system in the beginning of 2021. So following this release termed CASA 3.0, in our Nexus IT platform in 2021, all incoming ANDAs for solid oral doses forms were reviewed under this modernized and structured review system, which we term CASA. So what I would like to do is to go over the CASA platform and, il and illustrate what we can achieve to date. So this slide shows the actual landing page of the CASA system that assessors utilize once they log on. As you can see, the CASA system is currently used by the three review disciplines that evaluate these ANDAs, including the drug product discipline that reviews the drug product design and its controls, the Office of Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Assessment, that reviews the manufacturing process and associated facilities, and the biopharmaceutics discipline that reviews the dissolution as well as other aspects related to the biopharmaceutics performance. So let me go more specifically into the drug product discipline to show how CASA works. So one of the important facets of the drug product review is to capture or flag 
the inherent risk of the various drug product critical quality attributes, such as dissolution, impurities, potency or assay associated with the drug product. And also, that's the first thing, not only to capture the initial risk, but also to capture how these risks are controlled or managed based upon the drug product design or testing control strategies. As mentioned, one in impetus of the cause of structured review is to ensure more consistency and objectivity among our staff. And this is achieved based upon objective risk ranking algorithms, which is the first thing, and structured descriptors for capturing risk control, which is the second thing I would like to discuss. So the first, the COD has encoded algorithms in its software that capture inherent product risk associated with these various critical quality attributes present in the drug product. And these algorithms using a failure mode effect and criticality analysis, or FMEA, FMECA for short, system encoded in the COS IT software, objectively rate these inherent or initial critical quality attribute risks as low, medium, or high. And this prospectively flags to the assessor the area of high risk that need to be focused on, and conversely, the areas of lower risk that the assessor may not need to spend so much time on. And secondly, and I think equally as important, the CASA captures the risk mitigation or control based either upon formulation design or control measurement control strategies using a drop-down of descriptors of structured knowledge for formulation and design and control strategy measurement that is typically used in pharmaceuticals. For example, if the CQA flag is high for polymorph transformation of an amorphous form, one of those fundamental strategies in our drop-down is the addition, if you selected, you would say, it would say the addition of a stabilizing excipient to avert crystallization of the amorphous form, among other drop-downs, meaning that that's one of many. In essence, these drop-downs, which are based upon our fundamental scientific understanding of pharmaceuticals, are, descriptor, are descriptors of that structured knowledge for formulation design and control strategy. And the importance of this is that, is that it provides a consistent scientific dialect in our CASA assessments, which were, not, which were previously lacking in our freestyle narratives. And by having these consistent descriptors and dialect, it not only ensures consistency of our assessments, but more importantly, it enables knowledge management, as I will show later. In addition, as I mentioned, our traditional assessments were long narratives with cut and paste from the submission, which, I, it was, which was indicated it covered our ability to share and manage our risk information and knowledge amongst the many applications that we have. And here the slide depicts how the CASA would also, in addition, um, enable a more compact assessment. Once the, select, once the assessor selects the fundamental for, formulation strategy to mitigate the CQA risk, then they have the option to explain via short narrative how that formulation strategy was specifically applied to the application. For example, if they select a drop-down stating that an excipient in our drop-down menu is used to stabilize an amorphous form, they would write after that drop-down a short narrative explaining what that excipient is the API or active pharmaceutical ingredient and excipient ratio, and how they how the sponsor systematically optimized those those features of the formulation in their pharmaceutical development. And rather than cutting and pasting large sections of the pharmaceutical development report, which we previously used to do, they would simply link to their corresponding page from the ECTD submission from the sponsor. And by adopting this strategy, this makes for a more compact assessment where all the information is really accessible in a, in a highly structured format.
But so let me just take a step and put this all together. One of the reasons we developed CASA was to enable knowledge management. And this is nicely illustrated here. Based upon adopting the same inherent risk algorithm and a drop down of structured descriptors for risk control, we enable product, drug product risk analytics and can now objectively compare risks across a drug product line. E.g., we can compare an application of various generics approved across that product line and the corresponding NDA or ROD as to how these risks are controlled among the different applicants and different applicants have, will have different ways to control these risks. For example, first we can see all these, all, all these products have the same inherent risk for assay failure due to the instability based upon our algorithm, which is used similarly in all applications. So we have the same inherent product risk, which is high. And secondly, using these structures to just for of risk control, we can now objectively um, see what, that while one manufacturer mitigated this risk by the minimus approach of relying solely on stability testing program, which was captured in that dropdown, others incorporated to varying degrees formulation design features which were similarly captured in, that, in those drop-downs that I alluded to previously to mitigate this risk, or which were over and above testing. So ha by having this structured review format in the CASA, we can now run risk analytic reports in CASA to compare these relative product risks among applicants depending on the risk control selected in, on those drop-downs. And thus in the drug, drug product, in, whether in the supplements or in determining in, um, inspections at facilities, we can run these reports. Hello? We can run these reports to allocate our resources to the products we believe are at higher risk. Can I ask a question? I can't see the document. Yeah, I, I think we've lost the, the slides, uh, Joanna. Okay, I'm going to go to that slide. I don't know where you lost the slide, but I'm, I think I have an idea. Yeah, I think you were on 30, 32 was the last slide, uh, Becker. And, I, and, I, and, I, and the point that I really wanted to mention was by, you know, really having this structured review, you know, format both, both on the initial risk and in the risk control strategies, we can run now, we can now run risk analytic reports in CASA to compare these relative product risks among the various applicants, depending upon the risk controls that they, that they select to do so. Some will do better, some will do more than others. Thus, in the drug product, thus in the drug product life cycle, in the supplement or determining inspections at facilities, we can run these reports and use this information strategically to allocate our resource to the products we believe are at highest risk. So similar to capturing risk control in a structured format, we can also capture the drug product control strategies, such as specifications and the general, generalizable rationale for the control and drop downs, similar to what I showed you before for the risk. And by having this, this structured format you know, for, the, for the controls, similar to the risk analytics, we can also run reports to compare these attributes across a product line. So we can easily determine if an incoming ANDA for a product line, if we, we can easily determine with these, with these reports that, that if the ANDA were having these attributes, we could determine whether the ANDA with these attributes was within the space of the approved products within that product line. And conversely, we could determine if the ANDA had attributes that were outside the approved space of that product line. And as such, this can be used to inform the risk of the AND in question. So that's really the power of these, of these analytics. So then the next slide that I would like to go to is to illustrate the, a little bit the structured review in the manufacturing 
integrated assessment, just very briefly. As you can see, the manufacturing assessment is very similar conceptually to the drug product assessment. But rather than focus on drug product design and measurement control, it focuses on the risks of the various unit operations that may affect the various drug product CQAs. It similarly identifies the inherent risk of the unit operation via algorithms, as we did for the drug product, and it also, and the corresponding risk control via drop down, similar to what we did based upon the drug product. But in this, this case, the drop downs for the risk control is based upon a combination of factors of both process factors as well as facility factors. And I know this will be covered in more detail in the next presentation, but the bottom line I want to emphasize here is that similar to what we have shown you for the drug product, we can now run reports based upon the structured data to discern the site's capability to manufacture these various doses forms based, up, based upon their prior history and particularly their, their history with these unit operations. And such reports will review the risks of the site's de demonstrated capability to run those unit operations. And with that degree of scrutiny required, you know, as we make the decisions to, ins to inspect or not inspect these facilities. And finally, let me, let me briefly go over the biopharmaceutical, biopharmaceutics assessment in CASA. Biopharmaceutics is complex. And partly because of that, rather than invoking a paradigm of three risk levels, low, medium, or high for each CQA, as we did for the manufacturer drug product for inherent risk, biopharmaceutical, biopharmaceutical invokes five risk levels from very low, low, medium, high, and very high. And at one extreme of very low, a simple standardized dissolution test would be sufficient to mitigate the risk for that product. And at the other extreme of very high, in vivo studies to develop an IVIVC or IVIVR may be needed to support a patient-centric dissolution test. And rather than invoking risk algorithms to determine each of these risk levels, as we do for the product and manufacturing, the biopharmaceutics assessments use predefined decision trees that are similarly, that are encoded within our CASA software to guide each assessor as to where the product falls within these various risk levels. So similar to drug product integrated manufacturing risk assessments, these structures not only provide for a more objective objectivity of risk as we assess these products, but also enables CASA analytic reports related to various aspects of biopharmaceutics across our product line. So, with all this effort toward development of CASA, I, I believe we have made significant strides. I can say with confidence that we are, de are certainly realizing our vision of knowledge management. And this is evidenced by the fact that today CASA has 17 analytic reports that provide assessors with critical information for making informed decisions based upon CASA's structured knowledge of drug products and facilities. And these reports were not previously available in our unstructured narratives. So this is quite a, quite an important development. And just as important, we have made significant steps toward solidifying the use of CASA amongst our assessors. And ever since the go live in early 2021, over 1,400 reviews across the three review disciplines have been finalized for ANDAs for solid oral doses forms. Um, So, in sum, with the CASA 3 launch, we have made a significant step toward realizing our vision of structured review to ensure objectivity and knowledge management. But this is just one step of many in our roadmap as we move this paradigm to drug substance, other doses forms, INDs, NDAs, BLAs, as will be discussed later by my colleagues. But I just want to mention that next in our journey, and I think we're pretty close to it, we are on track to fully de deploying this CASA framework to the drug substance evaluation early next year. And the slide shows the CASA 
assessment card in the Nexus platform that we intend to deploy in the first quarter of 2023. And with this future release, this will realize, similar to what we have received for the drug product manufacturing and biopharmaceutics disciplines, the concept of a structured review, and with that, more objectivity and also manage, knowledge management of drug product risk, based, for example, on their synthetic pathway. And, and what is really, I think, very, very exciting is that this is not only applicable to drug substance self-reference to ANDAs or GMFs, but also be extended to NDAs moving forward. And this is a prelude to the extension of Kaiser from its initial inception for ANDAs to now NDAs and BLAs, as will be, as will be discovered by Dr. Wu and, 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 and Dr. Welch in later presentations. And so to conclude, the Kaiser system you know, measures risk associated with how a product is designed and manufactured using established rules and algorithms. It establishes how the risk is mitigated and controlled through standardized, you know, um, drop downs that capture our um, the product design features as well as measurement features. It assesses the manufacturing controls and the demonstrate capability of facilities involved in a structured format. And it uses all this information, and it really takes knowledge management to a whole new level and emphasize, emphasize to, so that we can provide, you know, oversight through the product's life cycle based upon the risk. So thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Seyus uh, Sinontidi, Office Director of uh, the Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Assessment of OPQ. And um, I'm excited to be joined today also by um, Dr. Shah, who is our Associate Director of Science and Communication, and who has been leading uh, our experts in collaborating across the various uh, offices and disciplines to bring forward this exciting system that we are presenting today. And uh, my presentation <clears throat> today will cover the overview again of how CASA tool integrates manufacturing assessment at the commercial scale and provide you with a, a roadmap of what's coming next and then Dr. Shah will um, describe the salient features of how we have built into CASA to enable our SMEs evaluate systematically the risk of the proposed manufacturing at the commercial scale and facilities. As described by our um, just recent uh, speakers, our CASA employees models that uh, allow our integrated team to evaluate the drug product. Um, also a dedicated model that incorporates manufacturing integrated assessment and also a biopharmaceutic assessment. And um, as noted earlier, this system allows us to intake the application data and capture the critical assessment information in a very structured format that can be easily viewed by all of our SMEs performing the assessment, share this information readily, and utilize it in to determine um, what actions are necessary or to be taken on the application. As noted again, um, our CASA for Manufacturing Assessment is utilized by our SMEs to um, measure the risk associated with the product design manufacturing using established rules and algorithms, and um, especially assess the manufacturing control and the capability of the facilities to manufacture the product over the life cycle of the product 
beyond actually the approval point and um, basically evaluate the risk and mitigation and the control throughout this manufacturing life cycle and bring in the facility into um, our assessment and basically take this knowledge management to a whole new higher level of the product life cycle. As noted earlier, our integrated uh, quality assessment is performed by a collection of disciplines and teams uh, that are shown on this slide. Um, and um, the Office of Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Assessment is concentrating on assessing the application elements related to microbiology, facility, and process, and also link into these any inspection information that we have around the facility, and especially um, in addition to also determining whether a facility requires a pre-approval inspection and work together with our, our other offices to perform these facilities and obviously ensure that the, the information is captured into uh, our CASA system. Um, here is a, um, a broad overview of the CASA roadmap related to the manufacturing. As um, noted earlier, we already have implemented the manufacturing models for the generic solids and data analytics with a 3.0 as we launched the system in 2021. So what we anticipate to expand CASA in this, this coming fiscal year is to expand the um, model to include manufacturing and micro, uh, microbiological assessment models for the genetic liquids and data analytics, and then continue to expand uh, CASA with the um, manufacturing models for the NDA solid and including established conditions and data analytics, and uh, then follow up with, with the liquid formulations and eventually expand CASA to include biologic, micro, and facility models. And at this point, I will welcome Dr. Shah to um, describe a little bit more detail of what entails inside this CASA for manufacturing. And um, Dr. Shah, please take it from here. Thank you, Dr. Sinontiris. Uh, so, hi, this is Rakhi Shah, and I'm going to cover a little bit in detail what we do in OP OPMA and how we are utilizing this CASA currently and what are our future plans. As previous speakers mentioned, we have launched our assessment in CASA for solid generic applications for all three disciplines, including product quality, manufacturing, and biofarm. Uh, Dr. Andre Roy explained drug product quality assessment in CASA, and this is uh, what uh, the slide presents manufacturing CASA. And we are utilizing smart template to do our assessment, which is based on science and risk based principles. Um, we are utilizing those principles even outside of CASA, but I will show you how we are organizing this CASA, uh, uh, our assessment in structure format. And as Andre said, the structured assessment is very helpful uh, when we want to call it out and when we are doing our future assessment. So the assessment is organized starting with overview page where some of the information is auto-filled from uh, the data that we get from uh, our 356H form, such as ANDA number, drug substance, drug product name, uh, then list of facilities, function, addresses, etc. Of course, we verify that information, our assessors do that, and then uh, CASA template is activated. Uh, first thing we perform is, uh, of course, initial risk assessment or initial risk analysis. Uh, we start with facilities where uh, in OPMA we evaluate all commercial facilities, including drug substance, drug product, testing, primary packaging uh, facilities. Uh, we have built-in risk-based algorithms 
uh, which actually includes uh, some of the factors such as prior facility experience with related dosage forms, related processes. Um, then if we had any quality concerns from that facility or compliance issues, so all of that is included in our algorithm and then uh, based on uh, the information that is included in application and what information we can find for the same facility from previous applications, we go through that uh, a systematic risk assessment. Uh, for doing this, we currently have to go through forms, uh, establishment, inspection report, recalls, field alert reports, compliance case reviews. Um, a lot of this information is buried in our Word documents or PDFs. So it takes a lot of time, but that, that information is found and then uh, we try to use that, that this is where CASA comes to our rescue where information is systematically captured and that will uh, that I will show you in the next upcoming slide uh, how we use that information. So that uh, is facility, then we uh, understand whether the facility has uh, risk factors or uh, outstanding risk that we will need to do pre-approval inspection or in, uh, in cases where we have adequate information and adequate uh, confidence that facility can perform this uh, uh, product or processes without uh, our uh, presence at the facility, we could waive the inspection or we could utilize some other alternate tools uh, that you might have uh, come across. So that is what is done in this facility risk module. Then next is the manufacturing risk assessment module. Uh, since in OPMA we focus on drug product uh, manufacturing processes, so we perform our initial risk assessment. Again, we use uh, risk-based algorithms. Andre Rao mentioned about uh, failure mode and effect analysis, so we utilize the same principle where we have our risk factors that are uh, based upon the unit operations and based upon the facility. We incorporate uh, all the factors uh, uh, in addition to drug substance and excipient factors uh, as well as uh, the drug product design factors. And we look at this holistically. We uh, have developed our algorithm based on that. And we take application information and the facility information and then uh, that uh, gives us the risk scoring of low, medium, and high. We have cut off. Again, this FMEA was developed uh, two years ago in OPMA, so we are still uh, modifying and looking at how the risk scoring can be modified based on uh, what information we get. So it's a continuous improvement of the model, but we use that, and then that guides our assessor in uh, doing the uh, uh, unit operation assessment or the assessment of facility and unit operation, either in abbreviated fashion or in full fashion, depending on what this score we get. So, for example, if we get low score for, uh, say, unit operation, the assessor doesn't have to spend a whole lot of time in assessing that unit operation. But if the risk scoring is high, of course, uh, they will look into all the process development, product development data, and uh, all the other in-process controls and factors, as well as scale up information, uh, and assess that in the unit operation module, which is uh, the fourth module as shown in this slide. If the risk scoring is low, assessor doesn't have to do this in-depth assessment in the unit operation section. Uh, they can do abbreviated, and then the final risk assessment is done uh, manually, so it's, we do not have automated algorithm for now. Uh, where, uh, so we still do it qualitatively, the final risk scoring. So initial risk scoring is uh, quantitative, but our final risk scoring is qualitative in OPMA. Uh, under this uh, other consideration, I'm just skipping microbial assessment for the time being, but other consideration, we evaluate uh, the batch record executed and master batch record, any yield reconciliation data, as well as whole time and uh, comparability protocol. Now with uh, ICHQ12, we have uh, PAC-MP, which also will be evaluated when we have NTAs in, in the module, and process validation if the data is 
submitted. So all this is assessed in other consideration section. Microbial assessment, uh, we perform, in OPMA, we perform microbial assessment also since we have our microbiology colleagues in, in our office and we, we try to do that integrated fashion. So uh, right now, since we only have solid generics, we are doing non-sterile microbial assessment for drug product control, and then assessment summary, which is the last uh, module in our manufacturing CASA. Here we have the uh, discipline summary, so manufacturing discipline summary, as well as the updated risk table. So that is uh, present in our assessment summary. So, uh, go, like, since we already have our solid generics experience, now we have started developing our liquid generics, since that will be coming up next in CASA, uh, hopefully. So this internal development has been going on for a year um, or so. So we are starting to use our solid modules uh, as a backbone so that we can use that as a leverage for and develop our generic solids module. Uh, liquids, uh, with liquids we also include semi-solids. So there are some salient features like we have unique unit operations that we need to cover. Under, so we will have unit operation module expanded. Then we have combination products which comes with liquid products. So we have combination product module. For example, we will need to inc incorporate device facility in our facility assessment which is not currently present in our, in our solid module. So with uh, this modifications, we would be able to achieve our uh, ANDA drug product liquid module. Um, with liquid, uh, we will have to have the sterile modules also, so microbiology module for aseptically and terminally sterilized products will be developed, which uh, our, again, D Division of Microbiology Assessment colleagues have been helping us develop these modules. And uh, for liquid, uh, for uh, manufacturing, we also take a look at extractable retrieval from manufacturing equipment, tubing, filters, et cetera. So we will need to develop that module. We already have our uh, risk-based algorithm for extractable retrieval, but again, that is being refined and finalized. So when we have that, we will in incorporate those algorithms into the liquid module. So uh, our hope is to enhance the current solid module to incorporate liquid module uh, with uh, c considering all this in mind. Uh, next, uh, as uh, Dr. Sinon today mentioned, we are developing uh, new drugs CASA, again OPMA is responsible for developing manufacturing which includes facilities. So we have uh, uh, already started this also effort. So this is based on, again, we, we will take a, our uh, drug product generic module into consideration. However, when it comes to NDA, there are some unique considerations that we need to give. For example, um, I was heavily involved in project orbits for oncology products reviews, which, uh, ut which utilizes uh, the uh, the collaborative global uh, approach of assessment with other uh, regulatory agencies across the world. So we utilize product quality assessment aid for that program. So that is kept in mind when we uh, start developing our manufacturing module for NDAs as well as uh, real-time oncology release because uh, that uh, needs a consideration. Now we have expedited program, uh, assessment program, so all that should be kept in mind. So we uh, do keep in mind in OPMA, we assess not only ANDAs, we also assess NDAs uh, already for manufacturing. So uh, we have quite a lot of experience of how uh, we can build the CASA modules, uh, keeping the flexibility that will be needed for NDAs in mind. Uh, while we develop NDA, we will uh, need to develop non-sterile liquid modules for microbiology, which is not present currently in our drug product module since, of course, it is non-sterile uh, solids and non-sterile liquid will have a little bit differences when it comes to microbiology. Then uh, we have uh, yesterday, I hope you guys were present, so we heard about ICHQ12 and established conditions. We have seen uh, that 
uh, during our pilot program that we got some NGAs or supplements containing established conditions. So we are going to build uh, that capability along when the NDA gets into CASA. So that will also cover post-approval change management protocol. As I alluded earlier, we have underneath other consideration uh, comparability protocol currently. So we will enhance those to cover PAC MP into that. And when NDA comes in, we also are uh, in trying to incorporate some of the complex dosage forms, which are not present currently in generic platforms. So for example, transdermals and some of our uh, dry product inhalers, topicals, which uh, we do not currently have in solid generics, so that we can enhance our uh, NDA modules to include those. Uh, next is biologics. Uh, again, Dr. Joel Welsh will cover in detail uh, what they are covering in terms of drug substance and drug product. Since, um, and as Dr. Sinontid has mentioned, in OPMA, we focus on facilities and micro assessment for biologics. So uh, those modules uh, would be a little bit easier for OPMA to develop since we have our NDA. And, and uh, also NDA in planning for micro and facilities module. So we are thinking that with uh, modification, we can utilize this uh, similar concept for biologics. Of course, a uh, lot of uh, not, uh, uh, things will be looked at, at when we develop the biologics module because there are some unique considerations which need to be considered. We will have established conditions uh, and PAC MP incorporated, and we are working extremely closely with uh, Office of Biotechnology products when we are developing this CASA modules for biologics. In OPMA, uh, we lead facilities ins inspection for biologics uh, as opposed to small molecules that is led by ORA, so those also need to be considered. But again, we are in very, very preliminary stage for biologics CASA, so I don't have a lot of detail. This is under construction, as you can see on this slide. Uh, this slide, uh, so this uh, up, up to now, I showed you what we have done and what we are doing, but the main power lies in the analytics uh, that we get analytical pack or analytics package from CASA. Uh, Dr. Andre Raw showed the same slides. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this slide, but again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, so far our assessments and our inspection reports have been in PDF format, and it. It's very cumbersome to get uh, information. If we want to gather information, it takes uh, sometimes not only hours, but sometimes days uh, to get, gather the data that we can utilize in a meaningful way to make our uh, informed decisions. With CASA, we will be able to get, we are able to gather actually the data, uh, the analytic package are formulated in a way that we can utilize that to make our informed decision. As uh, Andre mentioned here, we can look at the solution as a CQA and different unit operations and what the process and facility factor or risk mitigation strategies the facility is using or the applicant is using. So this is comparing the same CQA across different unit operation. However, we can utilize different applications, RLG information in a very structured way so that, and uh, very quickly so that we can make a informed decision. Another uh, main thing that I wanted to show you is how we are utilizing this data analytics to conduct our manufacturing facilities uh, assessment. So here, uh, it's a little difficult to see, but uh, consider that I got an application which is um, listed as XXX. Again, this is all mock data. So that came in, into my queue today, and I have this facility, which is Y facility. So I, and then I have a profile code. Uh, this profile codes are in the IOM, in, uh, operation manual for the, the, our uh, ORA colleagues. but um, And here there is a slight error. It should be listed as 
CTR. So, so consider that I have uh, extended release application today that came and I need to now see at the facility what kind of information I can gather. And I'm particularly interested in functional coding, whether the facility has done any functional coding prior to this application and whether I can get, gather the data quickly. So in like before CASA, if I want to look at it, I have to look through the inspection report. Sometimes I may or may not find. I have to call my ORA colleague if they remember they covered this. Um, they might have seen this, but they might not have put it in the EIR report because they did not find any concerns. So, so it took a lot of time, right, so, to gather that data. But with CASA, this output table is generated automatically based on the information that we have included in other applications in CASA. So for example, there are four or five other applications which utilizes the same facility, YYY. So those uh, application information is presented here. So I can look at what a drug product, uh, not only what drug product were covered, but also I can look at uh, what were the unit operations covered in, in those uh, applications or in those uh, at that facility. Since we are linking every unit operation with facility in CASA uh, while we are building uh, our reviews, uh, that information can be easily accessed. Now I can see whether the, uh, my, the facility of interest was present in other applications and whether the, they utilized any types of coding uh, unit operation. And depending on what information I can find, uh, I can say, oh, the facility has prior experience and maybe it's very related to the product that I am doing, you, you utilizes similar drug load, utilizes similar unit operation, and I may be able to waive that inspection. Or I can even utilize some of the alternate tools if I have some residual risk, which uh, or um, again, we can uh, indicate whether pre-approval inspection is needed. So all these decisions are made in OPMA, uh, whether facility will need pre-approval inspection uh, or, or use of alternate tools. So this actually data analytics is extremely powerful. This gives us that uh, kind of visibility and make helps us make informed decision. Uh, then this decision is sent to ORA and then uh, we, we work very closely with ORA in conducting inspection, finalizing inspection, et cetera. So this is uh, the most uh, important slide that I really wanted to show, but again, uh, there is a slight typo. TTR should be listed in profile code in the input table. Uh, so this again uh, was covered by Dr. Andre Rao. So uh, uh, how we are utilizing, so as I can now gather information on the site which was present in some other application, I can look at site's capability to manufacture related dosage forms. Um, I can even look at uh, the compliance history, any approved control strategies. So I showed you one example of unit operation, but we are able to capture control strategy also for those unit operation. So I can compare with the pending unit, pending application, and if the capability is there, if the control strategy is present, I may be able to lower the risk, and I don't have to really look like dive down into the review or dive down into the facility review. However, I can't find any information or the proposed site has not demonstrated that capability, then maybe I will be able to spend my more time. So we can ut utilize our time wisely. We can do these reviews quite efficiently. So uh, to summarize, uh, CASA is live for generic solids. We hope to use, utilize uh, the modules and modify the modules to make them amenable to NDAs, biologics in future. And this, this will actually improve efficiency and consistency. We can have what we have been uh, talking about, life cycle approach, CASA makes that possible. So I hope I gave you a gist of uh, what we do in OPMA and how we are utilizing CASA. Next, uh, Larissa will present uh, CASA development effort for new drugs. Larissa, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Raki. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Larissa Wu, and I'm the Associate Director for Science and Communication in the Office of New Drug Products in OPQ. And as mentioned today, I will talk about application of CASA to new drugs. 
So far, you heard from my colleagues about the successes that we registered when using CASA or quality assessment of genetic applications. But moving forward, OPQ also plans to build on these successes and apply all the lessons learned from CASA for genetics in order to expand the CASA program to new drug assessment. And one such lesson learned, uh, and really the key to success, was that we applied over and over uh, with each CASA release. Um, we applied uh, involvement of the user of the, CASA, uh, of the CASA system, which is the assessor, in every stage of the project, starting with development and testing, continuing with implementation, refinement of the prototypes, and finally ending with communication of the requirements to the um, IT group and completing also a user testing ahead of each CASA full IT release. And for development and implementation of CASA to new drugs, we're taking a um, sequential approach. First, as mentioned, we will implement CASA for drug substance, which is applicable to assessment of drug substance information submitted in drug master files, generic application, and I guess more importantly, new drug application. And uh, this release will happen at the beginning of 2023 in CEDAR IT platform as part of CASA 4.0. So it is worth mentioning here that CASA for drug substance prototype actually has been used in Office of New Drug Products since April 2021, and dozens of assessments have been completed using this prototype. Second, we are also developing CASA for IND and we're doing this through development and testing of a smart prototype for review of commercial and non-commercial IEDs. Third, um, as mentioned, we, we plan to adopt existing biopharmaceutics and manufacturing interfaces that have been developed for review of generic applications to new drug assessment needs. And not lastly, uh, we are also working on developing CASA for assessment of drug product information that is being submitted in NDAs. So um, Raki and Stereos already told you about efforts that are being done in the manufacturing are arena. So in my presentation, I will focus on our plans for development and implementation of CASA interfaces for drug substance, INDs, and new drug products. So I'm going to start with CASA for drug substance. And really the next six slides that you're going to see include the highlights of two and a half years of work uh, that we put into developing and implementing CASA for drug substance. So first, let's see what determined us to develop this interface. I've listed here on this slide a few reasons. There may be more, um, but the thing that I want to highlight here is reason number one which is to quickly identify problems with the drug substance synthetic pathway that can um, potentially generate high-risk impurities. And I think you are all aware of the recent situation that we faced um, related to nitrosamine impurities in pharmaceutical products. Um, like you already mentioned, in order for us to gather data, we spent countless hours um, uh, researching information that is needed to mitigate these risks. In the future, using CASA, we hope that we can quickly respond to these situations by quickly retrieving information from CASA in a matter of seconds. Not least important, um, through developing CASA for drug substance, we wanted to make sure that consistent assessment standards are applied for drug substance information that is being submitted in new drug applications, generic applications, and uh, drug master files, as I said. And we wanted to facilitate assessment and through the use of CASA analytics, inform our decision making and eventually increase our efficiency. And not lastly, we wanted to achieve a milestone regarding CASA implementation in a CDR IT platform. And once CASA for drug substance will be released, have a complete integrated quality assessment, that what we call an IQA review for solid oral products AND is done um, in CDR IT platform. So we started 
this project back in December 2019, as I mentioned, with the goal to create and implement CASA for Drug Substance Interface that would be applicable for assessment of drug substance submitted in NDAs, ANDAs, and DMFs. We spent a little over a year to develop requirements for a standardized and structured drug substance assessment, and then we programmed a complete CASA prototype that we tested with 20 super users. In the next step, we trained all assessors um, of drug substance information in ONDP, and on April 1, 2021, we implemented this prototype internally in, in Office of New Drug Products. And since then, as I said, dozens of drug substance assessments were completed using CASA, and we continue to collect feedback and refine the prototype as per the suggestions received. We are now in phase two of the project, and um, we're currently um, working to move the, this prototype to see the IT platform. And the interface is currently being tested, uh, and it will be released in two stages. In February 2023, so in a few months, we will release the CASA for drug substance modules. And about a year later, once a CASA drug substance database is uh, robust enough, we will release the CASA for drug substance analytic capabilities. So the CASA for drug substance interface uh, really was designed as a one-stop shop for assessors to um, review the drug substance information. And similar to other CASA interfaces that you have seen so far, the structure of the drug substance CASA does not follow necessarily the organization of the information that is being submitted in the application, but rather follows the assessor thought process when performing an evaluation. Just shortly, to give you an idea about the structure, we have an overview page, a standardized risk assessment, uh, we have a manufacturing page, characterization, drug substance control, and drug stability, drug substance stability sections. And in terms of CASA for drug substance functionalities, our interface shares functions with other CASA interfaces. And I refer here to linking to submissions that you heard from Andre, uh, following deficiencies across iterations, as well as uh, enhanced communication between primary and secondary assessors. Moreover, we have developed features that are specific to our interface. These features are the drug substance risk assessment algorithm and the analytics for structured drug substance synthetic pathway that include a chemical registration as well as um, capturing the synthetic steps in a structure format, which would be performed in global substance registration system or GSRS and integrated with CASA as part of CASA 4.0 release early next year. And in addition, as part of, of CASA 4.2 release, um, most probably in 2024, we will have analytics that will allow to search, to visualize, and to analyze the drug substance synthetic pathways. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this next. So one of the features that really sets CASA for drug substance apart and makes it complex comparing to other interfaces that we have developed so far is the Structured Drug Substance Manufacturing Module. When we designed this module, we thought in terms of our needs for knowledge management, and we structured the information accordingly. We are capturing in a structure format the flow of the reaction steps, the synthetic inputs and outputs for each step, um, as well as critical process controls, um, impurities, solvents, and reagents. And depending on the criticality of each step, the assessor has the option to perform a full or a simplified assessment of that step. As you can see on this slide, in a full assessment format, the assessor is prompted to input all synthetic inputs, outputs, as well as uh, control approaches employed, whereas in a simplified format, um, only synthetic inputs and outputs uh, um, can be captured. And we do this through integration with GSRS library for chemical structures. 
And in addition to, to, to this information, we also have separate subsections in the interface for control of study materials, intermediates, impurities, reagents. Um, and we realized that capturing all this information will need some upfront effort, um, especially when it comes to registering new molecular entities. But we believe that the payoffs in terms of knowledge management um, and uh, facilitating decision making are substantial, so worthwhile. This slide gives you a snapshot on how we can capture chemical structures in a structured format through integration with GSRS. We can register a new critical compound, such as starting material, intermediate, final drug substance, an impurity, by recording its chemical name, the structure, the role of the compound in the synthesis. And by doing so, we would receive an associated identifier, such as uni number in GSRS, that we can later use to retrieve this, this compound. We are currently working with GSRS staff, um, so when CASA for drug substance will be placed in the CDER IT platform, chemical structures will be easily accessible in the system, and once a structure has been registered into GSRS, it can be used by the next assessor for the next review without any duplication of work. And even better, I think we're, we're already taking one step further, and we intend to minimize the manual work that the assessors are doing um, in order to draw and register structures by using the so-called SD or structured data files. SD files are text files that tell the computer how a chemical structure looks like. And SD files are submitted by the applicants. Um, our original intent for SD files was to support the QSAR review but we can also use these files to facilitate the registration of new chemical structures via GSRS into CASA. At FDA, uh, we have been accepting SD files since August last year, and we are currently asking uh, drug master file holders as well as applicants to voluntarily submit SD files. So based on capturing the synthetic pathway in a structured format, we want to develop drug substance analytics that would allow us to display, search, and analyze drug substance synthetic pathways so we can easily mine information and, like I said, inform decision-making process. We have developed a rudimentary tool in the prototype, uh, as shown here on this slide, which allows diagram-like displays of the drug substance synthesis flow, synthetic inputs and outputs, and function of each synthetic step. And going into CDER IT platform, we plan to enhance this tool to include reagents, solvents, impurities. And once we do that, um, we believe we will be able to mine the structured information and search and identify reactions and com combination of reagents starting materials or intermediates that can potentially generate high-risk impurities. So now that you heard about our plans for drug substance, I want to spend a few minutes to talk about CASA for investigational new drugs, or IADs. We initiated this effort a few months ago, um, and I'm happy to report that we already have developed the first version of the CASA for IND prototype, which is applicable to small molecules. And in the months to come, we plan to test and refine this prototype, and hopefully sometime next year, we can implement this prototype internally in ONDP. And all these steps, we believe, will prepare better to finalize our requirements and communicate these requirements to the IT group when time comes to transfer this prototype to the CDER IT platform, which we uh, hope it will happen sometime in the 2024-2025 in the timeframe. A few of the highlights of CASA for IND interface are listed on this slide. CASA for IND streamlines the assessment documentation uh, for future IND assessments. It contains a building decision tree for selection of IND assessment. 
giving assessor the option to use either a full template or an abbreviated one. Moreover, CASA 4 IND contains building risk assessment considerations to facilitate a consistent review approach across assessors. And not lastly, um, um, is expected to enhance assessment efficiency and to pave the way for future knowledge management integration, which really spans the product life cycle from the initial IND phase. So as I mentioned, in parallel with CASA for IND development, we are also actively working internally on the development of modules for CASA for drug product, for new drug product prototype um, interfaces. And we initiated this effort um, in spring this year, and we are steadily making progress. We plan to spend really the next year discussing the requirements for a standardized and structured new drug product assessment. And possibly um, also uh, we plan to code prototypes that are reflective of uh, the requirements that we come up with. As for other CASA interfaces, we will test these prototypes, collect feedback from assessors in order to make refinements as needed, and then uh, we plan to implement the prototypes internally. And starting with uh, 2025, we hope to be able to transfer these prototypes from the desktop applications to the CEDAR IT platform in order to really take advantage of um, the full knowledge management in CASA. So for development of CASA for new drug products, um, in addition to um, our lesson learned, from, lesson learned from CASA for generics, as Dr. Shaw already mentioned, we also rely on our experience with Orbis, which is a project that allows collaborative assessment of critical oncology drugs between FDA and other regulatory agencies. So for this particular project, in order to increase efficiency of assessment for applications that are participating in Orbis, FDA developed a unified template or what we call Product Quality Assessment Aid, PQAA, that allows a systematic capturing of quality data by the applicant as well as systematic capturing of commentary and analysis by the FDA assessor. Um, this template, the advantage of this template is that uh, while uh, allowing this uh, structure and assessment, also at the same time, it focuses the assessment on the critical analysis and also minimizes the copy and paste. We want to build on this experience when developing CASA for new drug products. And in this regard, some preliminary work has already been done in order to reconcile the PQAA or this template with CASA for manufacturing, CASA for drug substance and for biofarm interfaces. So as I mentioned, when developing CASA for new drug products, we will leverage the already existing CASA interfaces for generic drug products, as well as CASA for drug substance. However, uh, we do realize that comparing to generics, CASA for new drug products interface will need some increased flexibility of assessment in order to accommodate new modalities or new technologies. Um, and in addition to flexibility, our interface will be customized to various drug product dosage forms. Um, and in the first stage, we, we already started with developing the interface for new drug solid oral products. And later on, we, continue, we will continue with the development of uh, new drug liquid products as well as other complex products. And based on some preliminary discussions that happened uh, in DP, we also plan to have similar interfaces for new molecular entities and 505B2 applications. And this interface, as I mentioned, will allow increased flexibility. But possibly um, the report, the analytics report that we'll get from uh, for this different type of applications will, will be different depending on the needs of the assessment. And at this time, we are also considering a uh, creating a separate CASA module for labeling chemistry manufacturing control assessment. 
So I hope that in the last 20 minutes or so, um, I was able to provide you with a good overview of our plans to expand CASA to new drugs. The take-home message here is that CASA for new drug products presents opportunities for knowledge management, consistency in decision-making, and improve assessment efficiency. And like I said, we are building the modules for CASA for new drug products using a similar approach as CASA for generics, but we are mindful um, in order to include unique elements, increased flexibility, and analytics tools based on the needs of the new drug product assessment. And um, as, as uh, it was mentioned before, all these projects really will not be possible without the hard work, dedication of uh, many people in uh, OPQ, OBI, GSRS staff, as well as IT contractors. So I would like to thank them all for their contribution. And with that, I will hand it to Dr. Joel Walsh, who will talk about application of CASA to biologics. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you for the opportunity and the privilege of being here. Um, I'm excited uh, to tell you today about what I think is an incredible next chapter in our CASA journey, which is the possible extension of this program to biological products in CEDAR. I think we all acknowledge the, the uniqueness of biological products, so I'm going to spend some time today telling you how <laughs> we're going to capture and manage that uniqueness, how biological products kind of fit within the overall cost of development program, and then talk about why these differences offer some, some opportunities as well. And from there, moving to explaining our development to date in terms of prototype and, and building testable environments, and then finally to sharing some screen captures at the end, because I think it's important to, to see what an actual system can and does look like. We've spent a lot of time already talking about the key objectives and the why on CASA, but I think it's, it's critical to highlight what these objectives are and how they apply to biological products. First, we need a, a CASA system that's able to capture and manage knowledge rather than just information during the course of a product life cycle. Secondly, we need to build expertise in as assessors to use that understanding to establish rules and algorithms and to use that in a way that facilitates the identification of risk, as well as how to mitigate it and even communicate it as well. Thirdly, we want to leverage the power of informatics to search across a portfolio of products. And finally, to, to do it all in a way that radically eliminates text-based narratives and with it offers tremendous opportunities to improve efficiency. While you've heard these goals already and, and some really good presentations this morning, what is critical to highlight here is that these opportunities and these, these objectives apply equally to biological products, and they offer really the same potential, and it's why we're, we're excited about the, the chance for, for CASA to be extended to biological products in CEDAR. Obviously, biological products are unique, and they're unique in, in a variety of, of different ways. So whatever cost of system we build, it will need to consider some specific nuances. Biological products are complex, and that complexity is not just size, but it's also the number of CQAs, critical quality attributes relative to small molecule products. So any system we build will need to consider the complexity in these molecules, and how to capture this variety of critical quality attributes. Secondly, biological products often have not just product-related impurities, but also product-related substances. Those substances may retain active flow activity, and that drives a need for, for not just understanding those attributes, but also how we think about characterizing a molecule, and from there, how we control that molecule. As we think about a, a control strategy, our CASA system will need to reflect that that some of our understanding is not derived from, from just commercial process and scale data, but frequently scale down models, which are needed to evaluate some aspects that we can't perform at scale, such as viral clearance. So understanding how a model is qualified and how it relates to a commercial manufacturing process will be a key consideration. <laughs> as we think about uh, attributes and, and what we monitor, 
we need to acknowledge that not all attributes are fully resolved by a particular method. You see in the bottom right of my slide a charge variant profile, one of our most sensitive assays, but one that does not necessarily re resolve all, all critical quality attributes. So our CASA system will need to understand the totality of how we monitor attributes and how the control strategy reflects that. And finally, you see in the, the bottom of my slide that molecules may have indication-specific critical quality attributes, not just molecule-specific critical quality attributes, depicted here as a monoclonal antibody, which in one case demonstrates binding, and in another case demonstrates antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity, but perhaps only in a subset of indications. So for this reason, our CASA system will need to reflect not just an understanding of process, not just an understanding of a molecule, but also an understanding of a molecule's mechanism and its context. Nevertheless, despite the challenges, biological products really do offer some unique opportunities, and I've chosen to highlight some examples of those on this slide. First, in the top left, you see biosimilars, and they are certainly unique in their development approach. You see a very common uh, schematic picture that reflects the traditional development paradigm for a biosimilar, which shows how analytics are truly the foundation on which the entire development program resides. This deep analytical characterization, in some cases, you know, dozens and dozens of assays, plays a key role in the development, and with it offers tremendous opportunities in managing knowledge and information that can be leveraged. Secondly, a renaissance in biotech manufacturing is underway. And in particular, we see tremendous development of platforms, company-specific manufacturing processes, and in some cases, plug-and-play unit operations, such as modular manufacturing, that allows us to, to see both the opportunity to capture and understand critical prior knowledge, as well as its uses and its limits. All these are opportunities for a cost of system. Thirdly, submission elements that are unique to biologics, such as completed prospective process validation, are particularly suitable to CASA. You could envision, for example, the power of an assessor looking side by side at characterization, validation, and proposed operating conditions all at once. Indeed, the power of looking in a structured way at all this data would be incredibly exciting for any assessor. Finally, key questions you could imagine assessors asking for biological products, such as understanding whether a particular pathway or target has been studied previously could be asked as well. In this slide, I've tried to show our development program to date for CASA for biological products. You know, certainly we have seen the value of CASA in the small molecule space, and we've asked ourselves, how can we do the same? First, you got to start, certainly, with an idea of where do you want to focus your attention. So we, we started with our initial energies on drug substance and bioclearance. Drug substance makes a lot of sense as it's the place where a majority of complexity in biologic manufacturing resides. Viral clearance is an important companion piece to that manufacturing, and I've mentioned previously it's a place where small-scale models might be used and they, where they need to align with how we understand commercial manufacturing conditions. Um, viral clearance also has some pretty well-understood calculations that make it pretty, pretty suitable to, to cost informatics as well. From there, we began identifying an approach to, to creating individual modules and developing them. Obviously, the strategy included discussions with assessors on what to capture, how to lay out particular elements of the system, and other considerations and elements they'd like to see built in. Soon after, we moved to creating testable prototypes, um, and from there, beginning to evaluate and study them. Um, in, in an exciting new development, we've moved to a, a new phase where we're really beginning to, to evaluate some of these modules under real-world pilot conditions. And finally, all this is going to set the stage for us to um, really move towards integrating these modules into a live live environment, and I'm going to show you some screen captures of, of some of these modules in just a moment uh, to give you a better sense of, of, of what they look like. Here I'm going to talk to you about the modules we've built to date. 
you know, like any pilot system, you need to start with a small, meaningful piece and, and build a prototype out from there. Our first prototype was built for a subset of our products, which are fed batch monoclonal antibodies. Um, this prototype was designed to apply to new BLAs, but I think you can envision how such a framework could be adaptable to life cycle changes at some point in the future as well. We selected this group, um, fed batch monoclonal antibodies, because of our robust familiarity, but also that they represent a majority of, of our submissions right now. From there, Two specific modules were created, the drug substance manufacturing piece and the viral clearance and adventitious agent piece. First, the drug substance manufacturing piece, it is designed to capture a description of the manufacturing steps and evaluation of the process parameters, including their ranges, and highlights key descriptive elements that are not characterized but need to be captured as part of any assessment. You could envision, for example, a descriptive element being a volume or scale of a production bioreactor. This viral clearance and adventitious agent module is designed to capture all aspects of adventitious agent testing and viral clearance evaluation that are needed as a part of an assessment application. I'd like to highlight now some some greater details about what these systems actually do to describe some of their key features and usability and to try to explain why it could be of particular value to our assessment staff. First, critically, the system is designed to reflect not just our own scientific understanding, but also that data and understanding of an applicant drive assessment decisions. This includes risk ranking and understanding of ranges of, of a particular proposed manufacturing step and process. Critically, this ensures that an applicant's data and scientific understanding drive the final ranking. For both modules, our prototype attempts to capture information requests, revisions, assessor comments, and are designed to be consistent with ICH Q12 concepts. As Dr. Shaw already mentioned, at this stage, microbiological and facility considerations are not yet included, but will be needed in the future system. As we move into a piloting stage, we intend to test our system in a variety of ways. This includes hopefully new and existing applications. This is hopefully to ensure that we will evaluate a broad portfolio of submissions and ensure that we capture critical information from our assessment staff on any needed augmentations. We hope this identifies gaps, areas of improvement, and more holistically, a sense on if we've been successful to maintain the vision of CASA and right-sizing the information we capture and have built in the strengths and opportunities for CASA we see to that biological product portfolio. Hopefully, if we do this right, it sets the stage for, for the continued development of new modules. I'd like to now show you a few screen captures. You know, there's a cliche that, that a picture is worth a thousand words. I think in this case, it might be worth even a few more than that. So I've tried to show you a few examples of what this system does look like. Obviously, any screen captures you see here are, are not final and certainly would reflect hypothetical data that are, that are mocked for presentation purposes. But here is just a starting page where you, where you select unit operations to describe a potential manufacturing process. Gone are the days of copying and pasting pictures from submissions and, and cropping tools and right-sizing them into a Word document. Instead, you click on unit operations from a pre-specified list. You pull them and you drag and drop them and rearrange them into an order based on an actual manufacturing process. This allows a, a, an assessor to quickly move into an assessment process. And critically, this allows for a system that can, can rapidly be expanded to to other unit operations and, and new manufacturing modalities, things like continuous manufacturing as, as processes and science continues to develop. It's rattled, readily expandable and why we think we see such value within this type of system. I've chosen to show you here a second set of screen captures. Again, this is a hypothetical example of a fictionalized application, but you see here viral clearance data. And this is the final summary, place, summary page for the viral clearance module. It would reflect what an assessor does after, after each individual unit operation has been evaluated 
and a final summary of the, the viral safety fact, excuse me, the, the safety factor for, for viral clearance validation is assessed. You see first it captures critical key information such as log reduction values at the top of the screen. And then it performs in an automated way a calculation we've been per performing manually for 25 years since the, the finalization of ICHQ5A back in, in 1998. Only here you see rather than a manual process automation and a final assessment against a known expectation that, that can aid and, and automate something that assessors already do already and why we think that there, even for this simple example, is so much opportunity within the cost of development program. As we move forward, this piloting is going to set the stage into a final push for integration of CASA into a real live final program. And that's really the, the success is taking these pilot systems and incorporating it into a live environment and not just using it for a handful of assessment topics, but really the entire dossier. Critical to, to us being able to do this, we'll be continuing to build in key learnings from our pilot development to date. And those learnings will be about usability, features we might identify, and learnings from small molecule world about things we can leverage, such as facility and microbiological concerns. All this will set the stage for a phased implementation where we can group like topics and begin to integrate them into a final assessment module. In conclusion, I'd like to just pause and say we're really excited about the opportunity CASA offers in the biological products area, and we feel like it presents really breathtaking opportunities for knowledge management, consistency in decision making, and assessment and efficiency. Biological product CASA will build on the same philosophy of small molecules, but I hope I've convinced you today that we are going to be able to reflect the needs and nuances of biological products within our system. As mentioned previously, we're going to need to build in not just complexity of manufacture, but complexity of critical quality attributes and some unique considerations. And we're going to do all that as we continue to learn from other organizations on their cost of journey as well. So with that, I'm, I'm excited to tell you we've entered a final stage, which is exciting, which is piloting a, a real system that will allow feedback and utilization, utilization of, of the system in a real environment. So that's, that's an exciting final development today. So with that, I'm going to pause and thank you for your attention and now invite Dr. Lawrence Yu to the, the virtual podium to talk about cloud-based assessment. Thank you. Well, thank you, for Dr. Watts, for your introduction. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Chair and members of the FDA Advisor Committee for Pharmaceutical Science and Clinical Pharmacology. I'm Lawrence Yu, Director's Office of New York Products and Rector of the ICHM4 QR2 Expert Working Group. Doc believes that the vision and roadmap of CASA, Dr. Stereos, the Sunotidius, and Dr. Shah discussed the application of the CASA for facility and manufacturing. Dr. Law, Dr. Wu, and Dr. Welch discussed the application of CASA for generic products, new drug products, and biologic products. My text today is I will cover cloud-based regulatory assessment and submission. I will describe the vision of the cloud-based assessment and structure application. I will cover ICHM4 QR2, common technical document revisions. I will discuss very briefly the pharmaceutical quality data standards. So CASA stands for Knowledge Aided Assessment and the structure application. As you can see from this slide, it consists of the KA and ASA. KA stands for Knowledge Aided Assessment. It's pretty much FDA internal driving, as you can hear this morning from Dr. Lee, Dr. Hu, Dr. Stereo, Dr. Uh, Dr. Shaw, and Dr. Watch, all the talks related to the facility manufacturing, related to the generic drugs, new drugs, and biologics. Certainly, we want to talk about ACA as well, specifically related to the contact information of submission, which we call M4Q, revision, 
allow the PQCMC or we call it electronic data standards. In fact, our effort in relate to the application specifically responded to your recommendation, which I want to, I want to thank you in 2018 at the Vice Committee meeting with the recommendation. Specifically, that you voted relate to the CASA initiative should the FDA consider the enhancement of submission format to improve the efficiency and consistency of the regulatory assessment, quality assessment. You vote all yes, 10, way back 2018. Specifically, the committee unanimously agreed that related to CASA initiative, FDA should consider the enhancement of submission format to improve the efficiency and consistency of regulatory assessment on the CASA initiative. Several members state that that will increase communication while making submission from, in, from industry easier and, and more transparent. In fact, both brand and generic industry represented on the committee agree that CASA would be good for both industry, of course, as FDA for the FDA as well. So our effort with this morning, we are hoping to come back to report our progress in the our, in submission format, our effort in this area. But first, I want to share with you the, the vision of the future regulatory submission and assessment. First, I want to discuss current regulatory submission and assessment. When I joined the FDA 23 years ago, new drug applications or generic drug application was submitted using track loaded of four binders and with a paper documents. In fact, to be the first generic application to file, the company has to be physically, physically stood in the line at the door of the office building. With the issuing of the ICHM4Q R1 uh, in 2002, across the region of the world, industry and regulatory agency now start as a submission based on a common technical document. Later, it is as was become an electronic format or ECTD we call it. Typically, this is achieved through the electronic gateway. For example, you submit an application to the FDA, you go through the FDA gateway. Of course, if you want to submit an application to Japan or Europe, you have to go through Japan or, or Europe gateway. So, but there's no question, this, this system is much more improved compared to paper copies 23 years ago. So therefore, today's regulatory submission and review was absolutely an advanced version in the eye of 23 years ago. But in today's environment, in the age of the digital, in the world of the digital age, this regulatory submission and review, to a certain extent, is outdated. The lengthy, unstructured textual narrative, as you mentioned by many previous speakers, with dispersed information and lack of efficient information exchange and knowledge management and data analytics, made our system not only efficient, but also not effective. In fact, industry very often voiced the need of a consistency for regulatory assessment is often when review what will not know what has been done by another review for the same or similar regulatory applications. So therefore, it's much needed for us to move into the new world, which is the IT friendly, user friendly IT world, which is facilitate information exchanging, data analytics, analytics and knowledge manage, management, management. So as you can see, the FDA recognizes this issue and the FDA, the needs of modernizing regulatory review. And we need to move from 21st century, 20th century to 21st century technology. Specifically, we need to move away from narrative unstructured data to structured data in order to best capture managed knowledge so it can be easily used for assessment of all future submissions. And structured data is highly organized and formatted so it's easily searchable 
in relational database. And the good news is the FDA go through a six years effort that we now, that especially genetic solid, is sitting in the high secure cloud environment. There's no question the cloud environment is on demand availability of the computer system, which is offered many, many benefits that otherwise would not be offered. And one of the fundamental issues we're still facing is, despite the regulatory agencies such as FDA for genetic drugs moving into the cloud-based system, digitalization is realized, but still receiving lengthy submission with unstructured submission text narratives, a lack of efficient information exchanges. So this is, I would say, the, the current status of a current environment. Now, one comment I was mentioning that uh, you would probably ask uh, both of the previous speakers of the information, why it takes so long? I have to tell you, if we got a tremendous support from leadership and the staff, we have, we're working very hard. It's simply because there's a lot of effort needs to be made. That's moving from current system in the cloud-based digitalization system is not just moving the review, current review, go through the system, get there. In fact, it requires three stages as you can hear from previous speaker. The first, we have to change our review template because our template is not fitted for the needs of a digitalization. Second, before we sit in, put in the, our system in cloud-based environment, we have to test out. We want to make sure all the issues are resolved before move to there. So we call the prototype, as you can hear from Dr. Wu's presentation. And the next, of course, we go through IT system put into the cloud so that all the information, inform communication can be freely exchanged, information can be searchable. In fact, in fact, because availability of information or data facilitated next, uh, next big wave we call artificial intelligence or deep learning, or uh, the, 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 the machine learning process come to play, with, which is certainly the CASA system facilitated the deep learning, facilitated artificial intelligence for, for us to do analytics to get where we want to be. So we envision, we envision the future regulatory submission and review will be both submission and the review are accomplished in cloud platform. In the future, all the data could reside in the cloud would be more readily exchanged between companies and the regulators, among the regulators, or even among the companies if you have a permission to access. Companies simply would inform FDA once a, a, a product dossier is ready to review FDA would then access the data or information from structured cloud environment. The use of a cloud-based solution for regular submission would enable a dynamic, more fluid exchange of information between industry and regulators and between regulators and among the industries. And the end result is speed the response to public health needs. To enhance efficient industry regulators will need to come together to align on approach for cloud-based data system, which could support large data set submission and facilitate the coordinated global regulatory review that proceeds simultaneously instead of by country by country, as you can see right now, or region by region. We believe this system will promote faster, more streamlined interactions between companies, regulators, empower regulators to perform more sophisticated analysis across the, the spirit of data studies, applications, and review. So there's absolutely no question that future regulatory system, which is called a cloud-based platform, will offer many, many advantages compared to our current system, which we're in. So one of the questions is, how do we get there? What things we need to do? First, of course, we need to have a regulatory assessment transformation. It's not just a, the change, it's, an, it's, thing, it's a transformation. So therefore, we believe that FDA's knowledge-aided assessment system, we call the CASA, certainly for, for, for us to get there. Besides the internal changes or transformational changes that you're within FDA, internal or regulators or like, we also need to change the regular submission for transformation, which includes the revision M4Q, R2, I'm sorry, M4Q, CDD format, 
along with the, we had the electronic data standards so so that all the information could be freely shared and changed between industry and regulators and between among the regulators. So, so therefore, I want to share the, uh, just a few words related to our effort and for Q opportunity for modernization of regulatory submission. As I mentioned earlier on, there's no question. Current CDD format is much more improved than what we had 20 years ago. Much more improved than what we had with the paper track road, the paper vision. But this is still have a significant opportunity in the age of a digitalization. So specifically, we perceive the significant some issues with the current CDD format, including number one, several ISH regions have not fully implemented uh, M4QR1. Modernization with a support and clarify global understanding of the future CDD means te common technical document enabled great regulatory coverage and harmonization decrease the downthinking. Number two, the new change or new guideline will align with the modern quality guidance, Q Q8 to Q14, and what other relevant ICH guidelines would have been developed to give great folks since issuing of M4QR2, which is developed 20 years ago, exactly 2002. Number three, M4QR2 guideline will provide guidance on the location of the information support multi-component or complex product, which is not available 20 years ago, such as antibody, drug, hydrogen, vaccine, and so on and so forth. And the 20 years ago, certain continuous manufacturers were never heard of, but today it's become reality. And also, M4QR2 guideline will facilitate leverage advances in digital tools, data management, and standards analysis to enhance efficiency, effectiveness of legal submission, and assessment. So what are specific issues we want to resolve? What do we want to achieve over there with, uh, with ICH M4Q? First, we want to expand the scope of M4Q R1 include all pharmaceutical drug substance or drug product, both chemical, and biologics. We want to establish the roles for M4QR2 as a main source of structure and location for regulatory quality information. We want to organize the product and manufacturing information in a suitable format for easy access, analysis, and knowledge management. We want to include the concept and data expectation present IC quality guidance aligned with the current recognized international standards and the guidance. Better capture pharmaceutical development and the proposed overall consumer strategy, which should be the backbone of the revised M4Q structure. Last, not least, enhance the quality margin to facilitate efficient effectiveness of regulatory assessment and submission. So specifically, we have six E's in mind when we talk about objectives here with M4Q revision or M4Q R2 objectives. We want to encourage global coverage of science and risk-based regular approaches in the preparation of dossier or application. We want to explain or define the organization the position of the information for module twos and module three. We want to enrich communication between regulators, applicants, enhanced life cycle and knowledge management. We want to embrace and product process innovation enabling efficient use, uh, efficient use of digital tools for submission assessment, preparing for the closed link upcoming ICH guidelines on strike product quality submission, which is next project. Elucidate regulatory expectations and support efficient assessment, decision making, and action. So with these changes, we believe that will benefit to first, the far most important is the patient and consumers. And for QR2 will go out guideline will speed it up the patient and consumers access to pharmaceuticals. 
or provide a benefit to industry as well, include the clarified regulatory expectations, facilitate applies enhanced IT quality strategy and visions, streamline regulatory application preparations, improve quality submission data standards, and so on. Not only in for QR2 benefit the patients and consumers, industry certainly will benefit the regulator as well, such as FDA. Enhance benefit the risk considerations, increase access to quality standards, streamline regulatory assessment, and facilitate the decision making and communication. So where we are today, and from 2018 year recommendation of the committee, in 2019, FDA draft the proposal, go through FDA as a chain of command and submitted to ICH. ICH endorsed our proposal, FDA proposal in May 2020. And in 2021, ICH approved the, the outline of the concept paper, which is developed by FDA. Last year, we thought ICH formed informal working groups Eventually, we begin to develop in those concept paper and business plan last year. Now, it, we are in the, in the progress, develop a high level structure thinking of M4QR2 as well as the details of the structure. We have a meeting next week, continue to develop the, if, uh, new divisions of M4QR1. Here yeah, is a specific give you a work plan. It's a ICH is pretty much a long process. We are envisioning hopefully to reach the step four in 2025, which is called the finalization of document for adoption in around the 2024 and 2025, 2025. So with that, I kind of discussed with you our effort and was related to the, our set about what vision for cloud-based regulatory submission and the assessment. Also, I want to say very believe we talk about the data standards because in order to realize cloud-based assessment as a submission, we have to not only change the context of submission format, we also need to set up a regulatory st data standards, which is ongoing effort. And as you can see, as which we discussed quite often within, uh, or by myself here and also previous speakers, the current format is certainly an advantage compared 20 years ago, but it's certainly outdated because cutting the paste a PDF file is not searchable is really create a significant burden for industry and also significant burden for regulators. We're hoping moving in lecture data format in the ISH we call the, the structured product quality system. Also within FDA we call the PQCMC, but basically set of a regular uh, quality standard for facility visualization facility submission. So at the end of the day, we want to achieve cloud-based legal submission and assessment. And with our effort with CASA, and someday we'll be, we'll be there. I'm very excited about the future. Certainly, we need to work together, industry and regulatory all together to get our future vision of cloud-based regular submission and assessment, facilitate decision making, facilitate submission, facilitate assessment, and eventually benefit the consumers and patients. With that, I can close my presentation. Thank you very much. Hello. We hear you, Lord. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Doctor. We'll take a 10 minute break now. Panel members, please remember there will be no chatting or discussion of the meeting topics with other panel members during the break. We will reconvene at 11.28 Eastern Time. Thank you.
Hello, everybody. We reconvene. First, thank uh, thanks very much to the FDA speakers for excellent presentations. And uh, we will now take clarifying questions for FDA. Please use the raise hand icon <clears throat> to indicate that you have a question. And remember to lower your hand by clicking the raise hand icon again after you have asked your question. Uh, when acknowledged, please remember to state your name uh, for the record before you speak and direct your question to a specific presenter if, if, if you can. If you wish a specific slide to be displayed, please let us know the slide number if possible. Uh, and finally, uh, it would be helpful to acknowledge the end of your question with a thank you and uh, end of your follow-up, any follow-up question with uh, all that, uh, sorry, with uh, that's all for my presentation or all of my questions so we can move on to the next uh, pan panel member. And uh, um, I'll start with a with a general question for either Dr. Lee or Dr. Yu, um, and then I'll go down the line as uh, hands are raised. Uh, so the 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 question that I had, uh, or the clarification I have, uh, is really um, not to diminish the Herculean effort it uh, took to get all of this in place, uh, but as far as the sponsors go. Um, irrespective of revisions to the ICH guidelines, the information that's being required of them is no different, as I understand it, from what's in what's required now, the P2 and P3 modules, as, as we said. Is that, uh, is, is that correct? And could uh, one of you please uh, comment? Yeah, I, Nelly, I, you want to take off? Lawrence, Lawrence, would you want to to go first. Okay. Well, uh, Dr. Mollis, yes, it's correct. Uh, uh, clearly, as you can see, we implement for solid all of those forms, and the sponsor pub will feel no difference. In fact, one of the things I want to say is, is from the Dr. Lulisa Wu's talk, we implement CASA for drug substance, include new drug substance as well. Even though we we in, uh, uh, certainly we're in the prototype information, but uh, certainly NDA sponsor, you will not notice any difference about the uh, FDA response. So therefore, uh, Dr. Kemalis is correct uh, that that at this moment uh, we implement internally, no impact whatsoever on the uh, sponsor side in terms of format application from whether NDA, NDA or BRAs. Nelly, please. Yes, I agree with Lawrence. That's one, one, one of the things I emphasize during my presentation is we apply the same standard. So the analogy is that you're solving a math equation, right? You can either use calculator or the paper, but, it is, but the way you solve the, the addition or subtraction is the same thing. So I think that uh, I just leave it there like this. So there's no, no change. Oh, thank you both. I just uh, for clarification. Uh, so I'll uh, we'll go on. Uh, Dr. Carrico, uh, I believe, is next. Hi, thank you. This is uh, Jeff Carrico with the Dana Farber Cancer Institute. Uh, I believe this question uh, would be for uh, Dr. Lee or Dr. Raw, but if um, anyone else uh, feels suited to answer it, I'm fine with that. Um, I, I want to uh, start out and say that this is kind of a question about uh, the functionality of the system, and I certainly accept uh, all the positive attributes and um, and results that have been presented for us. Uh, uh, but I guess, um, and, and saying as well that I certainly support harmonization and standardization anywhere that we can, but I'm wondering, um, um, in the um, uh, recent experience, uh, how often did data or information not fit into the pre-approved categories or the selections uh, that a sponsor can make uh, 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 in order to uh, uh, classify it? And, and I guess I'm wondering, and I know I saw that there was the option for free text on certain uh, items, but uh, uh, could, could you just speak to, you know, was it most of the time that the uh, pre-approved categories uh, worked or were there times when, 
free text still had to be used. And uh, if if that was um, the case, uh, more often than not, uh, uh, what are the plans to address those issues? Thank you. Andre, can you take that? Yeah. Yeah, so this is Andre Ross. So I, I, I want to make, I just want to clarify the question. So just to be very clear, you know, this, this tool, this, this concept that we implemented is, 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 for the, is for the assessor staff, okay? So, um, so the, the sponsor didn't, didn't, didn't have to make those selections. We, 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 make, we make the selections. The other hand is the assessor. So they, the sponsor did not have to change anything in their submission. As a, so I want to be I want to be very very clear of that. Okay, uh, can I can I jump back in then? Sure. Yes, please do. So so uh, again, this is Jeff Carrico. So okay, uh, I I see what you're saying. I guess um, uh, my question would still be, were the pre-built options uh, uh, did they suit the needs of the assessor then most of the time or were there times when free text still had to be used yeah in terms of those those drop downs that you that you that you mentioned that i mentioned too yeah we spent a lot of time you know, developing those 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 drop downs and so i would say that in the vast majority of cases they would be sufficient that they would people would not have to select additional drop downs based upon what we have seen so far however we do we do understand that um as sponsors do develop new technologies and as new things come up in in in, in um manufacturing of pharmaceuticals we may, we may have to update some of these you know drop downs yeah Andre, i can um uh, i can definitely uh uh, talk a little bit to add, and then I also welcome Lawrence to also add a little bit to your question. So, uh, yes, like based on what Andre say, we have uh, enough and uh, enough and um, ample experience to really design the interface such that we'll cover most of the uh, assessment we do using the drop down menu. But certainly, we also understand that sometimes. Uh, there's a flexibility will be needed to allow assessor to uh, raise some question which may, may be more like a application specific. So we do have uh, that flexibility to build into the CASA. But, uh, but the job that menu, at least at this moment, will be uh, cover most of the question. And then on top of this, as part of a, a continuous improvement, we will continue monitor the CASA development to make sure that if there's some uh, area we can improve in terms of a drop down menu or building additional flexibility in the field, we will do so as well. So we definitely incorporate the continuous improvement to continue to uh, improve the system. Uh, so Lawrence, do you have anything to add to? No, uh, Larry, you said it very well. and. Uh, I want to emphasize, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Kergo, is CASA system is a dynamic system. You know, initially, certainly, uh, algorithm uh, building place will not be perfect. We recognize that. So we'll continue to improve process. And uh, when new information comes, new cases come, we'll continue to uh, building up our system, building up our rules algorithm as well. We recognize, for example, if the solid or this dosage form would be immediately this may be simpler, but in some cases very complex dosing may be coming. So we want to make sure CASA not that just apply for a, a, a certain percentage of application, we want to make sure CASA apply for all applications. So therefore they leave the leave the door open for continue to have a manual input of some information. But with the time I'm confident the system will become much strong, much better, and the today's system for solid dosage form probably is much, much better already than what we had five or six years ago. I'm hoping to answer your question. Thank you. Yes, that did answer my question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Uh, then uh, next, I think Dr. Kraft is uh, ready for a question, ready with a question, I should say. 
This is uh, Walter Cramp from Thomas Jefferson University. It's a question for Dr. Larissa Wu, and it's specifically about INDs for academic users and the CASA interface, specifically about investigator-initiated INDs and expanded access INDs. So n neither of these are leading to NDAs. What are the plans for stakeholder input and outreach as uh, these would be expanded to those IND activities in CASA. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question, Dr. Saul. So, um, in terms of INDs, again, the the effort that we are developing right now is internal, right? So we're, we are working on um, developing and testing smart templates that would help us evaluate um, IND submissions. Um, we plan to continue with stakeholder in engagement as we did in the past. Nothing will change in, in that regard. The only thing that will change is the way we will perform internally our assessment. I hope this um, answers the question. I can maybe just follow up and ask, is this going to be staged, so specifically for investigator-initiated IND and probably more for expanded access, would this follow the timeline on your slides or would this be subsequent to those timelines? So, uh, I'm sorry, can, can you um, specifically tell me which slide are you referring to? I, I guess there is a timeline that you would have for the rollout. And, uh, right. So, like I said, 42. Right, now, right, right now um, we are working internally to develop a prototype. And uh, really the focus is on, on commercial INDs. Yes. Um, but um, in, in, the fu in the future, yes, sometime after 2025, we will probably r roll out to um, non-commercial INDs as well. But at this point, I don't see, I don't see any impact on the external uh, stakeholders. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, next, uh, I believe, Dr. Slid, you're, you're uh, ready with the question? Yes, thank you. This is Eric Slud. Uh, my, my question is from the point of view of statistics and data handling to enable the analytics, and it's especially related to the uh, CASA 3.0 that's already been implemented and, and that you have some uh, uh, data experience with. So it, it, it's related also to uh, Dr. Carrico's question. Um, as far as we understand, most of the data entry will be done by currently by assessors from what may be text-based submissions. Um, there's an issue of re reliability, repeatability, and completeness of the categorical data uh, fill-ins that these assessors do into what is necessarily a uniform data format uh, for the point for the purpose of doing analytics afterwards. So my my, my question relates to uh, 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 ensuring the the correctness. It's a it's a level of error. The correctness, the the uniform repeatability of the data entry from the assessors. Uh, thank you. Andrea, can you help out? Uh, you? Yeah, who would like to address that? I could, I could help out. So, so no, no. So, in terms of, so there's 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 two parts of it. So there's first third part, the review, the review part. Okay. Um. So in, in in the review part, you know, they have to make those assessments, and the risk of their making an error is the same whether they're doing a narrative review or, or or not. I'm a little bit confused about that question. And also, we do have a secondary review. And we also Can everybody meet, also please? Can you please make make sure to identify yourself when you're answering? Thanks, Andrew. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. 
so this is how Andre Ross speaking. So to be very clear, there is going to be. So. Okay. So you. Andre, do you want me to help I, you? I, like, I, I, answer yeah, that? I want to answer the question. Yeah, this is a Larry. Uh, so let let me know. Let me make sure, like, if I understand the question correctly, uh, are are you uh, uh, asking about the the accuracy and also uh, the precision about our data analysis using our current review process? Uh, thank you. This is Eric Slug again. So, yeah, to clarify the question, uh, I'm interested in what amounts to data entry for purposes of having a uniform product to analyze in your risk analytics. So the issue is whether entries are being made, for example, from text input to what amounts to uh, categorical data uh, levels, uh, whether these are correct and repeatable, and in some cases there may also be missing data. Um, so it's those data handling aspects that I'm asking about. Thank you. Oh, oh, yeah, thank you. This is very clear. So in terms of the missing data, we, we will not be concerned about uh, at this one because we do have ability to ask uh, data from the sponsors, right? And then with our, our current, we already believe, as I mentioned before, we have an integrated quality assessment team. So each discipline will have uh, someone very expert in that particular area to do the data analysis to ensure the data entry, right? And on top of this, because we are, um, because we are also make sure that the data entry is correct, we also have a secondary uh, level of a review to look at the assessment, including those uh, data analysis, to make sure that that is not going to impact uh, our final decision. So as you can see, we internally, from the process perspective, as well as uh, using a different discipline, will be in a lot of a checkpoint to make sure all these uh, data doing uh, uh, are correct and precise uh, t uh, for the purpose we intend uh, or for the for the purpose of the regulatory uh, decision, and and then uh, so that's one of the reasons why we like if but I have to say it's going to based on what we have right now it takes a lot of time so that's one of the reasons why we actually move to the 21st century to utilize more structured data as well as the IT uh, to help us to streamline this process and I believe uh, Lawrence would you like to uh, make a little bit more uh, uh, comments but at least like right now I, I, I'm pretty confident what we have is correct but it just takes much more time and take more uh, manpower to do so so you know, Larry, you ask uh, you answered very, very well. The first question is uh, with our FDA internal review process, we typically have a two layers of review. We call the primary review review and second layer review. So second, one of the functionality of the second review is to make sure that prime, what the primary primary review did is correct. But certainly, this we pretty much done this right now manually. But in the future, if a jewelry application is a structured format information, we not only can be certainly a secondary continue to verify, but all the application data could be verified by computer automatic as well. So therefore, CASA system will increase the effectiveness of our assessment. That's why we say it kind of facilitate our decision making process. And uh, Dr. Alex, I hope this answers your question. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, it, it's a very encouraging that you not only have these uniform formats, but that you plan to continually audit the process of data entry. But I'm asking this partly from the point of view of enabling the automatic data analytics uh, and, and risk assessments, because things must be fairly complete, not too much missing, and presenting some of the data experience you have of that sort would be very useful to, for example, statistical reviewers of your system. 
Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So, yeah. So one of the example we have right now, a lot of stability data, right? A lot of stability data. At this moment, we, we look at the stability data, we look at a computer and, you know, company analysis, I was primarily to make assessment in terms of like a solid condition and the shelf life. And sometimes some data is missing because when you test the long time data, but in the future, if all data coming with electronically, if FDA have an internal data analysis function in place, a lot of things which we manually do right now will become automatic. So, you know, I'm really, you can see from my voice, I'm so excited about the future. There's no question where the computer will help us make our analysis, regulatory assessment a lot easier. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, next is Dr. Amidon, Greg. Yes, uh, this is Greg Amidon, University of Michigan. I, I think you've already touched a little bit on the question I have, but I'll, I'll ask uh, uh, maybe for some uh, additional insight. Uh, and I think for, this probably goes first anyways to Dr. Raw. What, the slide that comes to mind is the slide 32. Uh, but um, the, the questions I, I have are uh, um, specifically, I guess, related to that assessment of, I'll say, initial risk that you've identified. Who uh, and how is that initial risk determined? Is that done by FDA? Is it done by the, uh, the company? Um, the second part of that question, I guess, relates to that risk control strategy. And you've already talked about how flexible that it is um, in terms of, of input and, uh, and the strategies that might be used. Obviously, some strategies are, are well known, but there may be innovative uh, novel approaches, and it's good to hear that that's, that's an option. And the third part of the question really, I guess, is related to that residual risk. I understand that's at least in part um, um, analytics, but uh, I guess I was still looking for maybe some clarification. Is there, you know, FDA input in that residual risk assessment as well? Um, uh, maybe a little bit more detail on how that uh, will work could be helpful. Thank you. Uh, you need to go. I need to go to slide 32. 32. We're getting to, we're getting to the slide. So let me see if I can answer 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 the the question. So the first one is about the initial risk assessment. Just be be advised. When we made this initial risk assessment, and this was actually discussed, we did. We did a very, so this is done by, not, not by the company, it's done by the, what we're doing in FDA based upon the knowledge we have, okay? So that's the first thing. Does that answer the, the first question? And we actually spent a lot of time developing this model. And some of this was discussed in, in the previous, um, advisory committee meeting that was that was done you know several years ago yeah dr amadon is that uh... uh yes i think that addresses the initial crit, uh risk part um and uh i i guess the the third part of that question was really related to that residual risk and i'm wondering if you can just provide a little more insight into to how ultimately that's determined analytics is part of it is it all of it, or what's the what's the view there? Yeah. Oh, the the the, the residual risk. So, okay. So, what I just when we talk about the analytics, what we really generally compare are the risk, you know, the initial risks, and, and the risk control, and the risk control strategy amongst other other applicants. So we'll know if one applicant. Did one risk control strategy versus an applicant if they did, you know, four or five, you know, risk control strategies, and the and the residual risk I have to I have to, we have to we have to admit 
is we don't have an algorithm for the residual risk from the input of the initial risk to the risk control strategy. So I guess what I'm trying to say here, maybe I can be a little bit clearer, is that, you know, we'll know, in, essentially they all have the same in, initial inherent risk because it's, it's sort of the same product. But then the question is, you know, we, we want to know which applicant, who, by knowing which applicant did just one risk control strategy versus another one that did, uh, you know, a bunch of risk control strategies, we'll be able to, to capture that in the analytics. So we'll be able to rate with which, which applicant has a more robust control strategy versus our other one, so we can allocate our risk. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, yes, I think it, it, it gets to it. I, I was, I guess, wondering if uh, there's an FDA uh, input there, you know, I'll say a, sort of a manual uh, input, or, or if it's just driven solely by analytics at this point. Yeah, can I, can I um, also make a comment? Uh, this is a Larry, and I also may want to ask like, Lawrence to chime in a little bit. Um, just to add to Andre's uh, for clarification question, right? Um, this is an excellent question. I want to emphasize that like the risk assessment and the risk algorithm we are doing is really based on a lot of input from our assessor. Uh, the experience they see uh, in the product. Uh, remember, we have a product with assessor, uh, facility assessor. So basically, we build upon this. It's uh, no different from what they are doing right now, the type of uh, risk, uh, the, the concept and the, the mechanism and the risk assessment mechanism is pretty much similar to what we are doing now. But because of the CASA, we can really formalize these type of uh, risk assessment framework where it become a more consistent. So you will eliminate the human to human uh, variation in terms of the risk assessment. Of course, internally, uh, FDA provide a lot of training on how to do the risk assessment. But this risk assessment, assessment framework is really built upon uh, what we have, what we learn from different uh, application and different uh, facility. So what we are doing now is no different from uh, in CASA, no different from what we are doing now, but it really the purpose is to reduce the variance of our risk analysis or risk assessment here. Um, so hopefully they, this uh, address your first part of the question. So, and then the second part of a question is about the residual risk. Um, so what I want to actually mention here, anything we can talk about residual risk, right? Uh, it's, uh, it's really like uncertainty. Uh, uh, it's basically, it's well, like how much uncertainty we are, you are willing to accept and what, where you are willing to uh, uh, go, go with it. And in terms of our risk framework, right, what we really are look, looking at is to make sure that as long as they have a control strategy in place based on our framework, we are going to be able to like, uh, because of the control strategy in place, the risk, the residual risk become uh, the low level, I think which we will be happy to do so, or the medium or low level, it depends on the quality of that specific uh, quality attribute. And then on top of this, nothing is, uh, and we remember, we still have a, a quality assessor there. They will also make a judgment there to make sure that all this uh, overall risk, including the consideration of the residual risk, will be comfortable to move forward with the regulatory recommendation. Uh, so I think that is, uh, hopefully, this will give you a little bit more clarity uh, in terms of our risk analysis. And I guess, Lawrence, do you have any other things to add? No, thank you, Larry. You said it very well. So, uh, Dr. Gray Aminon, the residual risk is pretty much when we approve a product or not, that depend on the residual risk. But certainly, we will also talk about the benefit of this specific product, right? So, this, therefore, we will consider benefit of the product and also risk of the, of the consideration. The FDA make a determination whether this application will be approved or not. If this product is very critical to the to the patient's unmedical medical needs, we probably going to tolerate about a little higher risk uh, residual risk than low risk. 
And also the residual risk at the end will determine how much if they're going to pay attention after post approval. So therefore, this there is you know yesterday you talked about quality management system. In other words, the quality maturity come to play. That this actually at, uh, in in the big picture thinking that residual risk will impact our continuous monitoring of the after approval. Of course, low risk you know the certain will be appropriate. High risk, especially on many medical needs, we may still approve a product, but certainly we FDA will ensure the future quality maintained even after approval. I'm hoping to answer your, your question, Dr. Graham, you know. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, that, that's uh, all for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, next, uh, uh, Dr. Venkatesh Kalar is uh, ready, I believe. TG? Uh, hi, uh, this is TG Venkatesh Kalar. Um, I have a couple of questions that are kind of related, and one is a clarity question. Um, through the presentation, one of the things that I, I gleaned is that uh, the inputs for CARS may come through various other initiatives such as USD, ICHM4Q, PQC, MC, and IQA. Um, and my understanding based on it is that uh, we will be working on ICHM4Q to make sure that the inputs for CARS are consistent. And this will, in, in turn, will minimize what uh, the sponsors or companies have to provide the FDA, and that we will be providing similar information based on this, and there will be no other information. Um, is that is that in this my understanding accurate? Was the first one. The second one was um, in terms of new products, where you see a number of different types of products: accelerated products, standard review products, breakthrough products. The amount of information that you will get on these products vary. And some of these, you may not have enough data to calculate things like CPK. How will CASA distinguish this in terms of review? Um, and and how, what, what would be the challenges? Was a question that I had. Well, thank you, thank you, TJ. Uh, this is Lance here. I'm gonna answer your question. And uh, we recognize that CASA is not a, like a one-stop shop. You know, the we we flip a switch, we get there. We recognize a stepwise approach. So therefore, when we design CASA, you probably notice the actual name, we call it knowledge-aided assessment and structure application. And so therefore, and in a way, knowledge-aided assessment, which is FDA internal driven, we apply to genetic drugs, new drugs, and biologic product. And the company continues to submit as is as of right now in PDF format except the internal process, if the internal process is more, way more into the digitalization to facilitate data analysis and knowledge management. As I said in my presentation, right now for new drug substance, for all the NDA new drug substance for small molecule, we already implemented CASA. And you probably will not notice any difference between FDA site. So this number one. Number two, certainly M4Q are, are to change along with the PQCMC in the future structure application will greatly facilitate, will help. And because right now, as you can see, OSS has to manually input a lot of information. In the future, it's all automatic. So, and I guess uh, if you look at, uh, you know, today is good and tomorrow is better, the day after tomorrow is even great. So it's a kind of perfect situation we are in right now. So this part of the reason we are talking about that as a stepwise graduate process. And the teacher, I'm hoping to answer your first question. Thank you, Dr. Yu, that does. Thank you. Regarding your second Thank question you. and uh, about the complexity of the application type, complexity of the technology, we want to make sure that CASA is not a very rigid system. You know, we want to make sure that this way it comes to risk-based approach. We want to make sure that CASA is flexible enough, able to deal with the advances in technology, advances in form, especially we talk about like a gene therapy. You know, the therapies, those are not even available. So, but we want to make the system with, make be flexible enough to handle this. That's part of the reason you know, what takes so long for us to develop it. Because, uh, you know, it's not, you cannot be one size fits all. And that's part of the reason that, you know, we cannot simply move, for example, from genetic space in new drug space without the changes. We'll have to make a lot of changes. And first, certainly from small molecule to large molecule, even more significant changes, as you can hear from talk from Dr. Wu and also Dr. Jack Wa uh, Joe Walsh. 
I'm hoping this answers your second question. Um, thank you, Dr. Yu. It does. Uh, it's it's uh, evolution is what I hear, so thank you. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And I, I can assure you it will be risk-based here. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Uh, next up is Dr. Lee, Dr. Kelvin Lee. Uh, thank you. This is uh, Kelvin Lee. I, I think this question uh, can uh, be for Dr. Welsh, but it's certainly open and welcome uh, anyone else from the agency to, uh, to help uh, clarify. So I, I, I do very much. I appreciate the presentations and a lot of work uh, has been done to date, and I can certainly understand the arguments about you know, the benefits of having uh, such a system to understand the risks, uh, particularly known risks. I, I wonder about your perspective on how the system as it's envisioned might or might not um, be used to address unknown risks, you know, given that the system and the, and the thinking here is that it's based on our latest scientific understanding, which is, of course, always advancing. So I, I'm thinking this might be more relevant in thinking about biopharmaceuticals, which, uh, uh, which is what uh, you presented about, um, where this could be more of an issue, and maybe that's why it's being proposed as uh, later in the kind of rollout development uh, plan for CASA. Um, I, I think my specific uh, drilling into that is our, our unknown risks, things that are envisioned to also be addressed through the CASA platform, perhaps through future advances in uh, you know, machine learning big data approaches, or is the going in assumption that unknown or unanticipated risks are not to be addressed with CASA and would be addressed through other mechanisms? Thank you very much. So this is this is Joel Welch. So let me kind of get started. I think with uh, with the with this response, you know, I think one of the hallmarks of what you've heard this morning is really the flexibility of the system. And from that perspective, we are we're trying to understand you know evolution of science and building in those considerations as we go along. And that's why back to this idea of continuous improvement, um, you know, we're going to be building in refinements as we learn things and go along. I think. To the question of how do we handle uncertainty in kind of a bigger way, you know, our system is designed to be flexible to have have those types of flexibilities already defined within the system. So, you know, for, for type, new types of molecules, having not a fixed level of, of list of, of all CQAs, but having the ability to have additional CQAs, for example, captured by an assessor as as a different type of molecule is is you know captured as we think about new types of manufacturing technology you know certainly we, we see what the future is coming and, and in some cases hopefully ETT the emerging technology program can can help you know us foresee some of those needs but I think we, we will be building a flexibility to capture additional parts of manufacturing controls additional testing strategies additional process parameters whatever that that need is the system isn't going to be rigid it's going to be flexible and we're going to we're going to accommodate that type of need i think in the flexibilities we design up front and i would say you know as a as a general philosophy you know casa is a tool and it's a tool to help assessors but ultimately the judgment around around a process, a product, a control strategy, and this kind of goes back to the last question of, of you know, what about you know when there's less data? The system is going to help us identify risk and understand it, and then build links to understanding how we think about managing that risk. So my 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 strong opinion is we're gonna we're gonna build that flexibility up in front, and as we learn, have a system that can 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 accommodate changes that we need as we identify the need to make them. Does that answer your question, Dr. Lee? I, I think it does. I, uh, this is Calvin Legan. Um, if I just drill into a little bit, uh, so can um, one of the, you know, a, a risk that could uh, come up that would be, let's say, not based on our current scientific understanding, but that uh, could emerge in the future uh, could be perhaps uh, an unknown issue related to a raw material, for example, um, where perhaps um, the current uh, state is one where uh, there was no particular concern that had been identified, but the future state is one where um, uh, the regulated industry realizes, hey, maybe there's something we need to pay attention to here. Um, can would would CASA as a tool help facilitate 
early identification of those kinds of concerns and drill into what, in that hypothetical example, what the raw material issue might be? Or would that, is that not sort of part of the intended use of and, and the this is This is, this is uh, Ken Morris, and, and if I can just interject and, and maybe this helps and maybe not. If it doesn't, please ignore it. But are you you're saying essentially if there's some sort of data mining in a sense that says that we've seen correlations that might suggest this ahead of time, is that what you're thinking at all, Kelvin? Yeah, I think that's a, a fair way to put that. Thank you very much. That That's a much simpler way of putting it than what I just tried to express. Good. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Dr. Welch. No. Hello. Joe, are you there? We kind of lost you. We, yeah, we lost you. We don't lost you, Joe. So, so maybe I can help uh, yeah. try and Lawrence, why don't you know, the Lawrence, in the Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Please. yeah go ahead. So one of the, you know, the purpose of all building cars are certainly flex flexibility and also the, as a tool to facilitate our, you know, the, the talk about the knowledge management and also the uh, digitalization. But uh, certainly the consequence of the, all this data is allow us for, to do analysis. And so this, this part of reason, once we have all the data in the electronic data format, you know, we can start to use artificial intelligence or machine learning or deep learning come to play. All these analytical tools could help us identify issues which we do not know at this moment right now and in the future. So I'm, I'm really feel that very grateful when to a system, such kind of system building up, we're able to detect issues which maybe with the human eyes are not able to detect. But I want to emphasize that those are tools and a final decision making still are human being. We are the reviewers to make a decision. And those tools help us identify issues, not to help, you know, help our decision making, but it will not make a final decision. Thank you. I'm hoping that uh, Dr. Kevin will be able to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this, is a Larry, yeah. Yeah, this is a Larry. I just want to just emphasize that CASA will be learning. So anything, if we feel like something is important, we, we like the cover is built upon the flexibility. We can incorporate those risks into the system as well. Uh, and then on top of this, remember the assessment. If we talk a little bit broadly, it's not just the application assessment cover. Like in the biological area, we can it's a holistic approach, which will also have the inspection components as well. So whatever we learn. Like we can actually go back to update or modify the CASA. And then just like Lawrence said, like at the same time, we can also use uh, the data analytics to see whether there's any specific trend which we are not aware of uh, to be able to uh, detect some of the new uh, high-risk area, as you mentioned, right? And also, I want to emphasize that everything is relative, right? I think we probably need to really compare to what we are doing today versus what we can do in the future. So like with uh, this type of system in place, we do believe that we can do better in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's, that's very interesting. Uh, Dr. Samboni is next. Um, yes, hi, this is uh, Bill Zamboni from the University of North Carolina. Uh, my question is, is specific for Drs. Ra and Shaw, but, but others could uh, clearly uh, join in. Uh, the two of you and, and many others have clearly shown the advantages of, of CASA. Uh, my question is if you could currently expand on what has been identified as the limitations of CASA through some of the pilot programs and, and things that you've run, and then also what are other theoretical limitations that, that still may occur? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I think that's probably, maybe we could start with either you, Dr. Lee, or Dr. Sorry, Dr. Yu. Uh, 
I think that's for Aunt. I, I Andrea, can start. Uh, okay. uh, this is Dr. Rakisha. I can start, and then Andre, you can chime in. So I sure. think the limitations, but we have launched quite a lot of deals from our solid generic CASA, and we see uh, some of the gaps that we consider opportunities for advancement when we build our next modules. So, uh, for example, uh, when we are going into liquid products, we understand that we do not have combination product module and uh, that, that we can have opportunity to build. And then I just heard about some of the unknown issues, right, unknown problems. So when we get into the next modules of CASA, that, that's what we are trying to incorporate, modify, update our models, um, not only the risk assessment model, but also some of the things that are missing from current CASA. So I would, I would say that it's um, the limitation uh, we have already, uh, uh, Andre Ross, Dr. Andre Ross showed that uh, about 500 plus assessments are completed within CASA. So every day we learn that, yes, there are, uh, whenever we, learn, we get into new IT system, it may be a little bit challenging in the beginning. People have to get used to new system, but those are all um, being mitigated and being discussed with our IT folks. They are on board with us, so we discuss with them, and then we uh, eventually come up with a better product every uh, with every release. So it, it's a continuous improvement uh, project. Uh, we understand that it's it's not perfect when it is. Uh, it was launched back in February, but we have made significant improvement. Uh, one one of the improvement that I can say is, uh, for example, when we built our solid generics module, when we are comparing with uh, our data among applica across applications, we realize that since NDAs were not done in CASA, it will be difficult to compare. So we went ahead and built modules so that we can have uh, data entry manually done for our NGA information on, upon which the generics rely, and so that we can have a clear comparison, as you can see in the slide that is displayed. So uh, these opportunities are found, and they are being rectified as soon as they are found. So th that is what I wanted to mention. Uh, but Andre, please go ahead and chime in if you have any additional thoughts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is Andre Ross speaking. So I want to, you know, make some comments. So first of all, when the Casa 3.0 was was launched last in in, in last year, 2020, 21. Yeah. So first of all, you know, we we have worked. We have. It's not like it was a static system that we didn't make any updates. We realized that there were, were some there were some some problems, and we did work to update to update the system. You know, better better to better capture. You know, for two for two reasons. One is to better capture certain science aspects of the assessment, and also to make it you know easier to use for for the assessors. So we we are we are con continually improving the system, and I also want to talk about this concept of unknown risk or risk that we didn't. No. Okay. So I think that's a very important concept because so so I just want to be very clear that when we developed all these algorithms and these risk mitigations, it's based upon the risks that we know. But again, if there are some risks or some mitigations that 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 we didn't know or some mitigations that were unknown, you know, we will definitely update update the system. But one thing I would be would I do think that is very nice about the CASA is like the assessor if there is a risk. So I just, if there is a risk that is not in the CASA right now, and the assessor wants to put it, wants to, to flag it, they have the capability to flag it. So, and also if there is a risk control strategy that's not within our drop down, the, the assessor can flag it. And one of the really nice things about that is that we can mine all this. So basically, you know, if there are new risks that are identified or new approaches to control are identified by, you know, the assessor can do that. We can mine those things, and when we can use that information to improve upon the CASA. In the previous thing, when we did the next next, and we did we the text-based narrative, we didn't we didn't have that capability because it was all text-based. We couldn't mine it. But now that we have this ability, we have the structured data. We can start mining unknown risks and new strategies and incorporate them into our model. So I'm going to end there. Uh, 
Well, thank you. Is that, uh, is that uh, su sufficient, uh, Dr. Samboni? And, and uh, I would say we'll take one more uh, question and then break, and uh, we should have time after the pu open public hearing to continue uh, um, clarifying questions. So uh, the final before lunch would be uh, Dr. Tong Lai, Tony Lee. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Uh, this is Tony Lee from uh, Purdue University. Uh, first of all, uh, kudos to the FDA team for uh, making CASA uh, reality, and they uh, and thanks for your presentation this morning. So uh, I just have a general question. Uh, I'm very interested in knowing more about the methodology and the algorithm that are used in the computer aided risk assessment. So, uh, so my question is uh, whether FDA has plan uh, to publish. You know this methodology and algorithm. Uh, for example, uh, on slide 40. Uh, I think we've lost lost you, Tony. Uh, yeah. So I have just general question. Um, so does FDA have plans to publish the methodology? and the algorithm that are used in the computer-aided risk assessment? Joe, do, do you want to there? All right, can yeah. you hear me? Yeah, yes, we can hear you, Joe. Thank you for the question. Yeah, now we can. You know, speaking speaking the biotech space, you know, I think are we going to publish? The answer is no, and I think the reason, you know, is that so many of the conversations that inform risk are conversations that happen outside of, of CASA. You know, questions around, you know, for example, you know, how do you validate a continuous biotech process? Right, those conversations are happening in an annex of, of Q13. Where are the unit operations? You know, and what are their critical features? for viral clearance. Those conversations are happening in, in Q5A. So CASA, you know, to me is, is, isn't the horse, it's the cart on this. And, and what informs science and risk is really something that happens outside of CASA. And, and you know, that, that I think translates to other topics as well, down to how we organize dossiers with, with M, M4Q. So I think there's a place for a conversation of, of how risk is determined, but I think that's a scientific consideration that that happens outside of outside of the CASA system and in other places instead. And I'd invite my other FDA colleagues to weigh in on that as well. Uh, can I just uh, weigh in for a second? This is Ken Morris. Um, just uh, the uh, when you say that it, it, they're uh, outside of the CASA the formalism, you're saying like from Q5A or that you're going to be using algorithms that are already existent outside of CASA, or are you? They're developing uh, new ones, and I think Dr. Lee may be linked thinking about that in terms of publishing. Uh, I'm talking about just an understanding at a scientific level of what risk is. But again, I'd, weigh, I'd invite my other FDA colleagues to weigh in on this topic as well. Joe, um, this is Delius. Um, uh, may maybe I can add to what you noted is that CASA is a tool that we utilize to um, obviously enter information and then the analytics and the programs to provide us with suggested level of risks and, and some results. Once we see the results that come out of this tool, the team as a whole discusses that. So it is not taken and, and then run with that necessarily without further consideration. And I believe that's what Joe mentioned, that the decision eventually about the level of risk happens outside um, the tool and um, allows our assessors to have a complete picture of what the result is being shown or is being calculated and discussed, then a decision made how to treat that and inform a decision. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Dr. Lee, is that? 
Yeah, so, so I guess that the decision risk assessment uh, decision actually is joint made uh, by assessors um, in addition to the uh, computer provided suggestions. So, Dr. Lee, uh, when we talk about computer computer assessment, we frankly, in a way, use uh, common scientific knowledge, knowledge in textbook, right? For example, in the let's say a, let's say a small molecule, we look into the physical stability of the molecule or physical chemical properties. We're looking into the chemical stability of the molecule. We're looking for biological property of the molecule. Then we can form like an initial informed decision. And then from there, we're looking into the dosage form design, like a formulation approaches. If, for example, the material, if amorphous material or manufacturing process, let's say continuous manufacturing, is a risk over there. Then we will look at, at, at the facility, which manufacturing facility also very critical, look at the impact overall. So we look at the product risk, we look at the manufacturing risk, we look at facility risk to, to, to make a holistic decision about overall risk level. So many of them could be uh, yes or no, some of them qualitative. So it's, a, it's not just a, like a simple answer, like one plus one equal two, you know, this kind of equation we're gonna use, it, but it's a very holistic overall process looking into the overall risk. That's part of it. It's kind of very difficult to communicate with outside of the FDA. And also many of the information could be evolution because once we publish it, people say this is what FDA is final, and then tomorrow we could change and evolve. Because I said, from you know the Larrys and the many other sources talking, CASA is an evolution process, and includes all the tools which you utilize for risk assessment, risk mitigation, risk control. Also, all the analytical function will also involve evolution process. So we'll continue to improve as upon right now. If we share with the public, it could potentially impact our ability, also impact the public as well, because frankly, the common knowledge is in the textbook or scientific literature. So it's probably not much difference overall when we give like a scientific presentation here. That's part of what makes us so difficult to present it externally, because we want to make sure we should present it, especially from FDA side, it's, in, it's a correct. But so therefore, it's, it's, a, it's an overall analysis of a situation, both of quantitative, quantitative, from product risk, from drug substance risk, from manufacturing risk, from facility risk, make overall assessment of the probability application. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah, that's all my, that's, that's all I have. Thank you, Ken. No, mm -hmm. thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Tony. Great, I'm and as always, uh, the, uh, the response to the or the feedback to the sponsor would always be implicitly control or uh, contain these uh, these decisions. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, we'll we'll break for for lunch until uh, one twenty uh, uh, Eastern Standard Time, and uh, we should have some time after the open public hearing to entertain a few further uh, clarifying questions. There's still a fair number pending. So with that, we'll. We'll now break for lunch and reconvene at 1.20 Eastern Standard Time. And panel members, please remember that no chatting or discussions of the meeting topics with other members during the lunch break should occur. Additionally, uh, you should uh, plan to join about uh, 10 minutes early uh, to uh, ensure you're connected before we convene at 1.20. Uh, so with that, thank you. and. Uh, have a good lunch.
Hi everyone, we're back. Um, and just before we start the open public hearing session, I'd like to turn it over to Rhea uh, for announcement. Rhea? Thanks, Dr. Morris. Uh, just before we resume and begin the open public hearing session, we'd like to make a brief announcement. One of the industry representatives, T.G. Venkateshwaran, uh, informed us that he will not be able to join for the remainder of the meeting. Uh, okay, thank you. More. So good, oh yeah. Thank you, Rhea. So uh, we'll now begin the open public hearing session. Both the FDA and the public believe in a transparent process for information gathering and decision making. To ensure such transparency at the open public hearing session of the advisory committee meeting, FDA believes that it's important to understand the context of an individual's presentation. <clears throat> For this reason, FDA encourages you, the open public hearing speakers, <clears throat> at the end of your written or oral statement to advise the committee of any financial relationships or relationship that you may have with the applicant, its products, and if known, its direct competitors. For example, this financial information may include the applicant's payment of your travel, lodging, or other expenses in connection with your participation in the meeting. Likewise, FDA encourages you at the beginning of your statement to advise the committee, to advise the committee if you do not have any such financial relationships. If you choose not to address this issue of financial relationships at the beginning of your statement, it will not preclude you from speaking. The FDA and this committee always place great importance in the open public hearing process. The insights and comments provided can help the agency and this committee in their consideration of the issues before them. That said, in many instances and for many topics, there will be a variety of opinions. And one of our goals for today is for this open hearing to be conducted in a fair and open way where every participant is listened to carefully and treated with the dignity and courtesy and respect. Therefore, please speak only when recognized by the chairperson, and I will thank you for your cooperation. So if we can have uh, the connection for speaker number one. So your, your, uh, your audio is still connected. So will speaker number one please begin and introduce yourself, and also please state your name and any organization you are representing for the record. Thank you. Yeah, Kim, may I just confirm that you can effectively hear me? Yes, I hear you fine. Perfect, thank you. Um, so I represent Amgen. I have no financial ties um, directly to the CASA initiative. Um, first, I would like to thank FDA and CEDAR for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Mike Abernathy, and I come to you not solely as an Amgen staff member nor a representative for Accumulus, but as an advocate for our industry, and most importantly, as an advocate for patients, of which I am one. Though the health science industry, and specifically the biopharmaceutical industry, is a late arriver to the 21st century technologies, when compared to other industry peers, such as the airline and banking industry, FDA's CASA initiative supports our transition from antiquated to modern technology. And thus, Amgen agrees with FDA that technological advancements to the processes by which regulatory submissions are prepared, submitted, and reviewed have the potential to transform the speed and efficiency of these processes with potential benefits to patients in driving faster and more efficient regulatory decision making. As a founding member of the Accumulus Initiative, we are committed to developing tools that will deliver on this promise that recognize the essential leadership role that regulators have and will continue to play in this change. Amgen strongly supports the general direction of FDA's use of technology to advance regulatory modernization. Nevertheless, we encourage FDA to acknowledge that CASA is a U.S.-centric tool that could inadvertently create further divergences in regulatory requirements across regions. In addition, divergence would have substantial economic impact by requiring sponsors to submit applications in multiple formats to satisfy USPQ CMC CASA initiatives and other international efforts. It would also hinder eff efficiency for sponsors potentially extending submission timelines and delaying overall regulatory processes on a global scale. 
FDA should further clarify about the relationship between CASA and other related initiatives such as FDA's HL7 PQCMC initiative, including the scope of PQCMC and the extent of its coverage across modules two and three, as well as ICH's emerging structured product quality submissions guideline. Accordingly, we strongly recommend that the agency consider a comprehensive CMC solution that factors in the evolving international regulatory landscape to ensure optimal implementation and use of CASA and PQCMC to drive efficiency and cost effectiveness. Such collaboration need not result in a delay to the introduction of this highly promising and potentially transformative technology. To the contrary, we believe that it will ensure the most rapid adoption. And though due to socioeconomic and geopolitical constraints, we will likely never achieve a single global regulatory submission to a universal global health authority. We can leverage technology, automation, artificial intelligence, and a cloud-based ecosystem to build structured and standardized, standardized regulatory filings that can be submitted to and reviewed by many health authorities concurrently. FDA's CASA initiative helps our industry take a positive step towards this future vision. I'd like to thank you for your time today, and I'd like to thank you for your service on behalf of patients. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. And uh, we, uh, I believe, have a second, uh, a second open public hearing speaker. Is that correct, Drew? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So, uh, speaker number two, your audio is connected now. And uh, will you begin and introduce yourself, please, and state your name and any organization you are representing for the record. Thank you, speaker two. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Raghuram Pannala. Am I audible? Uh, yes, I hear you fine. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for confirmation. My name is Raghuram Pannala. I'm working at Saigon Pharmaceuticals as a Senior Vice President Regulatory Affairs for Pharmacovigilance and Corporate Quality Compliance. I'm involved in PDA and other pharmacopoeial committees, uh, briefly or for more period of time. I don't have any financial commitments to disclose. To start with, I'm involved in regulatory filing compilations of DMFs for APIs and ANDS for generic drugs from 1994, and I have seen paper, hybrid, and electronic filings for various regulatory agencies. I thank FDA and CEDAR for providing me an opportunity to speak in the advisory committee meeting on CASA, known as Knowledge Aided Assessment and Structured Application. I appreciate FDA on CASA initiative, and I could see the benefits outlined as easy access for SSR and in terms of structured data, accelerated data analysis, and eliminating the text uh, and initiating the text-based narratives and eliminating uh, those things, sorry. I would start with a positive note on the navigation benefits and quick turnaround times with Cedar next gen and the advancement we have seen are highly appreciated in terms of Cedar next gen portal. I would like to make a few comments, suggestions for agency review. It seems FDA is aiming at moderately aggressive timelines for this. I'm having some concerns whether all the firms will be able to match the timeline in terms of resources updating and in terms of technicality and financials. As <clears throat> in the presentations, it was told that this would be implemented for API and drug product as well. I hope FDA will be able to provide the basic data structures and any associated open source software for this and associated validating tools as it involves financials. If an application is being rejected for any of the technicalities, the filer would lose some amount of money for it in the user fees program. It may be early or FDA may be already working on it. I heard Dr. Lawrence you speaking on the stability data statistical analysis. Hope FDA will make it clear what are the calculations followed. I know it should be as per ICH Q and E and or any other associated guidance in the same way for other data analysis, FDA may have to disclose the rational or calculations. I can understand risk creating and residual risk calculations are part of agency's internal protocol 
and need not be disclosed. Coming to the Unicode data or unstructured data to be loaded in the drop-down menus, this may be forcing all the forms to embrace entirely new structure or additional data generation. How is it so? If you take stability data as an example, as of now, firms are scanning the stability data sheets or attaching electronic data PDF sheets. If CASA is implemented, the dossier compilation may be an additional work or redundant work, and this may sometimes lead to typo errors. I'm agreeing that in future, new solutions may come in place to avoid this. I think CASA implementation in oral solid generics at Cedar also taken into consideration that the data extraction from the machine readable or OCR format PDF document uploaded by the filers or ANDS sponsors. Kind of a related subject, the data integrity part which manufacturers need to take care. Some basic protocols and expectations need to be met to answer internal QA as well as the inspectors from FDA. And firms cannot avoid the raw data recording and subsequent report preparation maybe like for stability or method analytical method validations or process validations and other registration associated data. So this CASA gener related protocols or data generation may be an additional work to the firms. I hope ICH will also align with FDA timelines and expectations in M4 revisions. As rightly told by my pre previous commenter, it involves membership representation from other regulatory and geographical regions in addition to FDA and geographical region, USA. FDA may have to clarify on data which has to be scanned and uploaded, like chromatograms or any other machine-related data. Also, sometimes we see CDR reviewers are issuing few deficiencies on data integrity or on the batch records, stability data, or any analytical raw data like chromatograms presented in the filings. Hope this human intelligence or intuition part will not be marked down by the machine intelligence. Stating all the above, I feel positive in implementation. Maybe I would like to quote an associated example, like recent advancements or changes in the health data management, updates in the pharmacies or doctor's offices, when successful despite of the educational and employee iteration rate at those institutions. I'm personally a little bit concerned on the data storage in the cloud and associated risk versus benefit analysis, but as it was rightly stated in the presentations and uh, the data presented on the website, we learn the new things as we move forward. On the whole, the data presented today was a little bit overwhelming, but I understand it is the future and I wish FDA will drive this change by helping all the stakeholders to understand the requirements of CASA. Thank you again for providing me an opportunity to speak. Thank you. So I believe that's the uh, final speaker. So the uh, open public hearing portion of this meeting has now concluded and will no longer, uh, we will no longer take comments from the audience. Uh, the committee will now uh, turn its attention to address the task at hand, the careful consideration of the data before the committee as well as the public uh, comments. Uh, and uh, since we uh, have uh, time left in the open public hearing uh, segment, as uh, as we said or before the break, uh, we'll uh, excuse me, <clears throat> we'll take more clarifying questions uh, that were started before. Um, and again, as we take the clarifying questions, please use the raise hand icon to indicate you have a question, and remember to put your hand down after you ask your question. And please remember to state your name for the record before you speak and direct your questions to a specific presenter if possible. If you want a specific slide to be displayed, then it would help if you had the slide number. And a gentle reminder, it would be helpful to acknowledge uh, at the end of your question with a thank you uh, and end of any follow-up with uh, that's all for my questions so we can move on. And uh, from before the break, uh, we still we have uh, some folks who are already listed. We'll start. We'll start with that. Uh, the first uh, uh, first question, or question is from uh, Dr. Richmond. Francis. 
Ah, thank you. Um, my question is a little bit different than some of the others that have been asked up to this point, but you talked about the stakeholders, you know, being largely insulated from the process, and I understand that. But there is one stakeholder, and I think that is the um, regulators in emerging economies who are using um, the judgments of stringent authorities uh, as the basis for their reliance activities. And I'm wondering, are they going to, in the future, be dealing with the submissions that are made primarily by the, the sponsors in the um, open text type format? Or are you thinking that you may be able to share these documents for their education? Thank you. I'm not sure okay. who I'm, uh, yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I can give this shot, maybe Larry's other can chime in. Certainly, we recognize, you know, that each country, each region is developing the different, uh, different space, like different uh, uh, evolution or development. And as you can see from the adoption of N4QRY, some region just like FDA adopted 20 plus years ago, and some region just actually the beginning adopting N4Q. So the reliance of the approval has come to play part of the reason, you know, with, I think we want to achieve regulatory convergency at the first. And then we're hoping that uh, that's why one of the, our goal with M4Q R2 is that each region will adopt it as soon as possible, include the developed or developing, the developed country or developing countries. And also, the, whether we're going to share CMC information or not, we'll have to rely on some kind of agreement among the legacy themselves. So that, uh, for example, we may have a share with EMA, but not in the other country. In other words, we have a bilateral relationship. And also, uh, especially when we share with sponsor information, we need the permission of the sponsor allowed to us to share. So there's many factors come to play, but I do believe that in CASA overall effort and, and facilitated communication will facilitate the reliance based uh, and uh, uh, regulatory action. One of the good examples we had with the FDA, we had a plan experience is Orbitz, right? When Orbitz was in, in the, this, in, in, invaded a couple of years ago, we have a relationship, for example, in UK and also Australia and the Health Canada. Certainly those approval is much quicker and, uh, and, and because uh, much less time consuming. So therefore, I guess to answer your question, the CASA and M4Q, PQCMC will facilitate but certainly to what extent we have to rely on not only the uh, scientific uh, technical approaches, but we have to rely on some kind of relationship among the regulators. I'm hoping this answers uh, your question, Francis Richmond. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. And our next, uh, uh, our next question, I, I think, comes from you, Maureen, uh, Dr. Donovan. Thank you. This is Maureen Donovan from the University of Iowa. And my question is, is more related to the, um, the pilot studies that have been going on um, on the generic solid side. And were there any metrics associated with those pilots? Like, have you tracked um, reviewer time commitment? Have you tracked um, communications to the, the sponsors and whether those have increased or changed in, in sort of time frame of review? Um, and really what I'm getting at is as, as these data are able or portions of the applications are able to be looked at more consistently, um, is that uh, post, post the time frame to input that data, is that shortening the review period and are problems being identified earlier in the process where additional data might be needed and that communication can go back to the sponsor? So the, to answer your question, yeah, we do have a, we have not kept track of what is really going on. I guess we are constrained, but we know uh, what, what's happening is truly helped quite a lot. And just to give you a very simple uh, uh, 
analysis with myself had experience. I was the acting director, and now the Steros, uh, the uh, uh, Tidus joining us as the director. We actually, the, our review, very simple analogy. We need to into the the company's address into our uh, assessment uh, template, right? So before you have to manually enter it, you know, manually into the we on average each application will have a six facilities. So you basically into the six uh, address. Now entering the six address of facility takes uh, some time, probably take a half hour, and many of you made a mistake, especially oh, a lot of sites is falling, you know, the various changes, address and stuff like that. But with the CASA, with the automation, it's very simple. It's not that the CASA with automation, be either like a 350H, it can automatic. Just that this alone save our review probably at least for 30 minutes. So the benefit is kind of obvious, and uh, you know, the way we know to improve the consistency, we know the effectiveness, but in a way, truly for a tracking, we have to, have to develop our matrix to see how we're going at this moment. I don't know, Andre and Rocky, do you have any additional comments or Lola saw any? But probably feel free to chime in. Yes, this is Larry Sao. So as Lawrence mentioned, the feedback that we received from our colleagues, the assessors so far is informal. Um, and in, in general, is, is a positive feedback, but we have not um, looked at KPIs yet. I know we have colleagues that are working on a survey as we, as we speak, and um, hopefully in the near future we'll be able to, to provide some statistics in terms of um, reviewer time commitment or uh, communication with sponsors and whether we improved on that or not. Well, thank you, Lulosa. I think one point I want to make is the development of cost as evaluation. And the CASA certainly interface will be very user-friendly, and that's why it's so widely accepted by our reviews. But another point I want to make is you're, in order to fully function, you have to have a database. Now, database building is, takes time, takes effort. And it, it will continue evaluation, and our data become much more, much more robust, and the certain functionality continue to be increased or enhanced. So therefore, if you judge like today's phenomenon versus tomorrow versus the day, the, the day before yesterday, is evolution process and make the judgment is certainly a little bit more challenge. But we will keep tracking. Hopefully, someday we'll kind of report back what are, what what are we doing. But we know based on informal conversation with our reviews, with assessment, the preliminary implementation, is as Lulosa pointed out, uh, um, it's very positive. I want to share with one of the story why we're doing this. One of the things actually we're doing this is, you know, way back in 2014, 2016, when we got an iPhone, we recognized iPhone were able to search all the public information about all the medicine, drugs, and those form, but within FDA, we're not able to search both. So essentially, we want to build a search function. Of course, we want more than that. We want to be we want to build not only search function of the, all the data, but we also do the, all, the, uh, all the data analysis with the going as well. So I, I think there's no question, for example, today what I ask you not to use the iPhone, it's almost impossible. Same thing is the truth to all of you as well. So just give you some kind of analogy how cars are powerful and informative and the user-friendly to all assessment. Thank you. So is that uh, sufficient, Dr. Young? And, and uh, I, thanks to the um, the FDA speakers for those um, additional follow-ups. And with the permission of the chair, could I ask a, a second question? Please do. Okay. My my second question is perhaps somewhat related to a couple of the public comments. In that, is is there? Are there already discussions regarding how the FDA is planning on using results that, that they internally find from their, their deeper dive into the data as the, the databases get built out um, regarding communication of, of thoughts, changes, things learned via guidances or other documents so that applicants are able to, in real time, um, provide the information that the FDA is going to be looking for. Well, well I maybe I give a shot of a second question. And uh, clearly, one of the when we have a data, 
we will do analysis. When do analysis, you have knowledge. And we will be love to share all the knowledge with the public because we believe at the end of the day, those are, uh, will serve the uh, not the regulators, industry, academia, and also eventually serve the public, public health. Yes, absolutely. That once we learn the, with the internal all the data, so we'll be happy to, we'll be love to share with the public uh, about our learning. Absolutely. Okay. Larry, do you have any additional comments? Oh, no, I, I mean, uh, I think I just want to clarify that. Um, uh, <laughs> I just want to let you know the concept and what we do actually for the CASA is it, really like basically using uh, IT, the concept and all, all the stuff actually we do it in the past is in, in human, right? Using our brain and manually. The, the things really make a CASA different is that we will be able to do it automatically. So, um, Really, from my perspective, at least, I don't feel like there's a guidance will be needed uh, because we are not doing to do anything uh, different, right? We still apply the standard, like, for example, we agree on the ICH, uh, all these uh, ICH, the quality standards in the ICH, we apply those. So I think uh, that definitely doesn't seem to me I just want to make it very clear is that we are not doing anything different, right? But to build CASA, it just will help us, uh, no impact on the industry, but it really just uh, help us to, to like, do our job efficiently by using the same principle. Uh, uh, so. Larry, uh, you have a yes, if I may also comment here, uh, on the on the question in trying to answer again the question as as we explained casa is an internal tool that allows us to collect all of the relevant information around a particular application or a process and allow our assessors to utilize that information in determining the next step in determining its adequacy as a result of that if we see something as we collate information from other relevant applications that are, are related, if we see something, uh, we will definitely reach out to the, uh, those, uh, those impacted applications or sponsors and let them know what we find as a result of doing these, these analysis and as a result of having these data available at our mm -hmm. fingertips. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes. Good discussion. I'm oh, sorry, was there more? Please go ahead. No, I was just going to thank the speakers once again for the additional information. Oh, thanks, Marie. Thank you. Uh, so I, I think, uh, Dr. Dr. Slott, I think you're, you're next up with question. Thank you. This is Eric Slud. Uh, I, it occurs to me that uh, you've been speaking about the uh, CASA functionality in two different ways. One is just as a general way of aggregating information more conveniently for the assessors, for, for, it, for the FDA evaluators, but you're also proposing something that isn't just a continuation of past methods, which is to do automatic risk scoring in a way that might uh, economize on human effort. And to the extent that you rely on that risk scoring, it's a matter of concern, of interest, uh, that you might want to publicize just how effective and correct that risk scoring is. And correct means that you will be fitting the models on the basis of which all of this artificial intelligence is done uh, with data, with data on uh, adjudicated uh, risks adjudicated, meaning evaluated by human experts. And presumably the quality of the risk scoring and the quality of the AI will have to do with uh, the uh, accuracy of the AI systems in reproducing um, something like what human evaluators in a time-consuming way would have arrived at. So I, I acknowledge that this will always be a moving target, but you could hope, even if you didn't want to publicize the direct algorithms that 
FDA uses. You could publicize in a way that would make it susceptible to external um, peer review um, the overall accuracy you're achieving in um, mimicking, in, in reproducing human adjudications of risk um, through artificial intelligence. Uh, thank you. Hello, this is Andre Ra, and, and I'll take a start at answering your question. So one thing that we do, so I think your your concern is, you know, we, we have these algorithms, and, you know, are they in line with, with human adjudication? So, and 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 should we evolve with that? Well, well, first of all, when we developed these algorithms, you know, previously, we, we, did, we, we did validate with human adjudication, so we thought we had a good start. But then one thing I just wanted to also mention, I think it needs to be very clear, is that when we have the low, medium, high for the initial risk assessment, if the human beings determine that, that there's a really a big flaw with that, and they say, like, for example, it's overestimating the risk or it's underestimating the risk, what we do is we have something that causes a system to say, you know, it's high. The, the, the cousin will say it's high, but the human will say, you know, I think it's wrong. It's overestimating and I'm going to override it, and I'm going to say it's low, okay? Or vice versa. It could be because it could say it's high, low, and the reviewer would say, I think it's I think it's underestimated when it's high. And the really nice thing about COSNA that we have is we know exactly what those interventions are. So we can use that information to optimize the, the, the risk algorithms. So we'll know that if... There's a lot of disagreement between the human expert and the algorithms. We'll know those those things, and we can mine that data, and then make the intervent and, and update the algorithms as needed. I hope that answers the question. Well, thank you. It does partially answer the question, but it seems to me, in the nature of AI systems, machine learning, that of course you're going to keep on updating the system to mirror um, what the humans would have evaluated as time goes on. But the question is, overall, what effectiveness you're achieving. Um, people will want to know that you're using tools that really benefit the organization, that, that this AI is panning out in terms of giving accurate assessments. And that's something that you might want to, well, certainly publicize within the organization, but maybe even publicly so that it can be evaluated uh, as a tool overall. Yeah, so is there any follow-up from FDA? Um, I actually have a follow-on question that, that, that might uh, <clears throat> might require some attention too, so but is there any uh, follow-up before I weigh in? Yeah, I just I wanted that, to, I, this is, um, go ahead, Lauren. Go ahead, go ahead, Rocky. Yeah, so hi, this is uh, Dr. Rakhi Shah again. Uh, I just wanted to uh, follow up on what Andre commented and what the question is. So when we are developing our risk-based algorithms, we are utilizing uh, prior knowledge into building those risk algorithms, but we do have kind of a validation set or test set that we evaluate against, right? So. We, uh, we kind of know its accuracy and we keep modifying it. Now it, it gives us initial risk scoring. It gives us uh, how much time we need to spend on one versus another where there is a risk ranking from low, medium, and high. However, assessors can always modify that, right? So we, when we take a deeper dive into application, when we take, uh, for example, deeper dive into facilities, we learn there are some more risk factors that we might not have accounted for in the beginning. So we can modify and uh, we do our assessment and we then ask clarifying questions to industry. So that goes on. So we are not uh, really utilizing um, artificial intelligence if you are mm -hmm. going in that direction so far. we. We are using assessors um, in, in doing our assessment. So I, I think we just want to differentiate, right? So uh, of course, there are risk-based algorithms, and we are trying to develop. We are trying to improve that as the time passes, as we have more information and more uh, knowledge. But this is like to, CASA is helping us turn what uh, tons of data we already have or we, we put it in our reviews that into knowledge that we can utilize and we can make informed decisions. It 
CASA doesn't do decision making for us. So I, I just wanted to clarify that. But uh, I hope that that answers your question, Dr. Swag. Mm -hmm. Um, so if I can, uh, Wayne, also, uh, any uh, voting and non-voting members are more than welcome to comment, of course. Uh, what one, uh, one aspect, this is Ken Morris, if I can backtrack a little bit, I mean, reviewers always use their historical knowledge, have always used their historical knowledge uh, to assess risk at some level, uh, um, uh, subjective, uh, maybe to some degree, but it's based on experience with, with other filings. And the way I was interpreting what, what we, were, we were talking about earlier during your presentations, and in particular, <clears throat> particularly uh, Dr. Lee, but uh, the, uh, the, one of the advantages of CASA is, is that you have that historical knowledge of the, the, the individual reviewer, but now you have it across products and you have it across other reviewers if CASA works as you intended to, I believe. And the question part of this is um, it's, it's sort of what we were uh, talking about a, a little, uh, sorry, a little earlier with Dr. Slud is that um, at some point, instead of just m m sort of mining the data, looking at the data across products and across investigators, are, are there also going to be uh, algorithms I heard like prior knowledge or is this like Bayesian algorithms or is this going to be just the um, accruing of the information and drawing conclusions I hope that makes sense I, I'm way out over my skis when it comes to Bayesian analysis yeah this uh, is Larry I think we can uh, uh, is it okay I make some comment as well please please do I, I'm back off of this to you <laughs> Yeah, just to clarify, um, yes, I, I think that some of, I think a, a lot of people are very interested in how we actually do the risk analysis, right? Um, and also, like, how do we actually get those information? At, at least, like, from my perspective, I think we do have a no issue to really point out some of the high-risk area in our algorithm to make sure that, like, people can understand which uh, area they need to pay attention. Uh, so I think those uh, definitely can be, uh, we, we plan to uh, consider to sharing uh, those information. Uh, Lawrence, I think you have some uh, comment as well. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Larry. And, uh, you know, absolutely. And CASA, not just uh, we develop those digital rights decisions, and not just to uh, benefit the FDA. We certainly want to eventually benefit the our stakeholders benefit the public as well. So therefore, and uh, as much as we can, and when time mature, and uh, when the OR, we will be happy to share like a key risk factor we consider, so the English should be aware. Especially we, uh, we for example, we have published a number of the paper related called the common deficiency, where the company uh, common deficiency related to the uh, the genetic drug application or common deficiency related to drug substance application, so the industry can learn what we the what the factor we pay attention to and the strength of those high risk factors. We will do the same again the, to all the committee members that in, in the future when when the when times appropriate, we feel confident with our own. Uh, analysis of data so will be shared with the public so that you know the stakeholders industry can learn from what the regulator thinking eventually benefit the public uh, 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 at the end so absolutely i want to i want to assure you we're certainly happy to share especially our ladies our deputy director already promised yes we will share i want to make sure that it's not like a we not, it's not that because we don't want to share as privacy we want to publish as many people as we possibly can but sometimes <laughs> You know, the you like experiment in the middle, right? If you're a middle experiment, you have not reached a conclusion yet. You want to publish the data, seems very high risk unless you want to get a tenure. But I'm sorry, I'm not saying you get a tenure to this. But <laughs> certainly, I want to be, I want to make sure that uh, when 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 our our uh, knowledge about risk has become mature, we'll be happy to share in the public. So thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you, Lawrence. And I, I actually, I don't. I think everybody at the committee uh, consensus, they understand not being able to sh share specifics. I, I sort of thought between uh, Dr. Dr. Slood and Dr. Lee that, that the questions, the question was whether or not it's going to be, 
um, whether or not there's at least a consideration or the potential for using these uh, models internally, not so much whether or not they were shared immediately. Although Absolutely. God knows uh, academics, uh, academics uh, hate to publish, you know how that is, yeah. <laughs> so I apologize, I think there's some comments back, okay, so. <laughs> yeah, but thank you. I, I, think that, I think that clarifies it. I think uh, we'll, I'll do a summary after we you know, get closer, so. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I believe that was the, um, the end of, uh, of discussion for clarification. And, and uh, with that, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Rhea, we're ready to go on with que to question one. Yes, we can move on to question one. Okay, so if uh, you could go ahead, if, uh, go ahead with the instructions. This is a voting question, and Rhea Back will provide the instructions for the vote. Thank you, Dr. Morin. Uh, voting question one is a voting question. There are two questions today. Voting members will use the Adobe Connect platform to submit their vote for this meeting. After the chairperson has read the voting question into the record and all questions and discussion regarding the wording of the vote question are complete, the chairperson will announce that, that voting will begin. If you are a voting member, you will be moved to a breakout room. A new display will appear where you can submit your vote. There will be no discussion in the breakout room. You should select the radio button, the round circular button in the window that corresponds to your vote. Yes, no, or abstain. You should not leave the no vote choice selected. Please note that you do not need to submit or send your vote. Again, you only need to select the round radio button that corresponds to your vote. You will have the opportunity to change your vote until the vote is announced as closed. Once all voting members have selected their vote, I will announce that the vote is closed. Next, the vote results will be displayed on the screen. I will read the vote results from the screen into the record. Then the chairperson will go down the roster and each voting member will state their name and their vote into the record. You can also state the reason why you voted as you did if you wish to. Are there any questions about the voting process before we begin? If not, I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Morris, to read the voting question. Thank you, Rim. So the voting question uh, number one is, do you support the long-term strategy for developing and implementing CAFA at FDA and expanding the system from generic drugs to new drugs and biologics assessments? And uh, at this point, if, if there are any uh, Issues or questions about the wording of the uh, of the uh, question, please uh, face, uh, raise your hand, and we'll acknowledge you. I'm just giving people a minute to decide. So I I see uh, hands up as uh, Dr. Lee. Uh, Kelvin, is that is your hand up for this, or is that uh, residual? No, it's up for this. Okay, good. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, thanks. This is Kelvin Lee. I have a <clears throat> question to help me understand uh, the phrase long-term <laughs> strategy. Uh, I, I wonder if there is a more simple description uh, that can be shared of what is included uh, from the agency's perspective on long-term strategy. Uh, and the reason I ask, uh, if, in case this context helps, I think we've heard and discussed uh, a number of important reasons for why the agency is interested in, um, in CASA. Uh, they include you know, data collection issues. They include helping to make um, agency staff work more efficient. Uh, there's, of course, the assessment understanding of risks. And then on the, the longer term, uh, there's uh, not only the development and, and pushing for pilots, but also um, you know, a globally harmonized cloud-based system as an end game. So it, I'm not clear what part of that long-term strategy uh, we're thinking about 
and whether that also just refers to the expansion of the system from generics to new drugs and biologics, or is it long-term strategy is one part of the question, and the and expanding the system is, is kind of a, a part B of that question. Thank you very much. So this is this is Joel Walsh. I'll I'll start and certainly invite others to chime in. I would say it's it's really an intent to continue to development, develop the system, and for that development to reflect using using this approach across the entire portfolio of products, generics, new drugs, biologics, as well as doing it across the life cycle of the product, um, INDs, um, original application assessments, as well as supplements. This is Larissa Wu, I can chime in. So certainly, as you could see, we have been working on CASA for a few years uh, already. Um, and we have made tremendous progress, but we're not yet where we want to be. Um, with the implementation of every IT system, um, as you could, as I, as I mentioned in my presentation and you saw in, in my colleagues' presentations, there are certain stages that we have to go through uh, for the development, testing, and uh, implementation of, uh, of CASA into the CDER IT platforms, and that takes time. So um, I think Andre Ro in, in his slides uh, showed the roadmap for CASA IT productions. We are now in 2022, but this effort really will continue to 2027 and probably beyond. Uh, in order to be able to have all the disciplines and all application types that we want uh, in, in the CASA system. Hope this um, answered the question, but I'm, I'm welcoming others to, to chime in. Yeah, thank you, Larissa. Yeah. This is Larry. Uh, uh, Kevin, this is a good question. Yeah, I think it's just a very simple way to expand our current, what we learn from 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 the generic side to apply the similar concept to to the new drug as well as our biologics, and because I think uh, the workload we have in uh, all the different space are quite tremendous. So these uh, system will be critical for us to make sure that we continue to meet our increasing workload, but at the same time maintain the quality of our assessment to make the uh, uh, the best uh, science and risk-based decision. Thank you. Thank you. That uh, time, Dr. Lee, are you? Yeah. Th thank you. This is Kevin Lee again. I I think I understand it. I I think what I'm hearing is um, a slightly different wording. Uh, we're going to vote on the words on the page, of course. But one of the things that I was hearing is um, it, it's also about supporting the continued development and implementation of CASA and expanding um, is another way to think about the phrasing. So if yeah. that's way off base, I hope somebody will clarify for me. Otherwise, I think I'm good. No, I, think that, I think that's correct, Calvin. This is a Larry, but oh, thank you. Thanks. Good, thank you. Uh, Dr. Slut, do you, uh, <clears throat> you have a wording question? Yeah, yes, thank you. I, I would like to ask a little bit. Uh, this is about the long-term strategy part. Um, certainly the development of uh, a unified system for collecting data, the, this is something that, um, you know, it, it, it's been, you know, extensively argued and persuasively argued um, uh, will, will help the SDA's mission. Uh, I'm concerned about the possibility, though, that agencies do sometimes develop legacy software that then has a life of its own. I didn't hear as part of the long-term strategy, for example, an evaluation of whether, in addition to the unification of the database, uh, whether the software tools, for example, the automatic risk scores, could conceivably uh, turn out to be a little bit counterproductive if they weren't quite accurate in mir mirroring what humans would have evaluated as appropriate risk scores. And that's something that will be an empirical outcome and require evaluation. So it seems to me that as part of this long-term strategy, there are these two aspects, the development of the unified database, but also the development of the unified 
uh, data analytics, and I wonder if those need to be distinguished. Thank you. Well, uh, Dr. Schlitt, could, could, be clear? could you please clarify your question again? I did not catch your last question about one of the comments. So the, the, the question is whether there's an evaluative part that certain elements, especially the risk analytics part of the, uh, that, of the uh, strategy, that would then become an ongoing tool that risk assessors would use um, whether this is going to be evaluated for effectiveness. It's less clear to me that that will uh, go on forever than that this unified database will be of use forever. Well, Stereo, do you want to make a comment here? Thank you, Lauren. I, I want to assure uh, Dr. Slad that, that this is part of our continual effort of enhancing the system and, and, that, and that always evaluating its accuracy, its performance, it's part of an ongoing process. And I would say, yes, of course, it will be part of that strategy to continually test how how well it performs and and continue to improve it. Thank you. So that does uh, augment the, the wording of the question in a helpful way. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, I think I, I do not see any more hands up for clarifying questions. Uh, am I correct, uh, there? Yeah, I don't see any additional hands um, so we can move on to voting now. Okay. So if there are no more, uh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Morris. Okay. So if there are no questions or comments concerning the wording anymore, uh, then uh, we'll begin voting on question number one. Uh, so Ray Abat will now uh, take us into the voting section. Thank you. We'll now move voting members to the voting breakout room to vote. There will be no discussion in the voting breakout room. Subconference rooms are open. Voting has closed and is now complete. Once the vote results display, I will read the vote results into the record.
the vote results are displayed. I will read the vote totals into the record. Dr. Morris will go down the list and each voting member will state their name and their vote into the record. You may also state the reason why you voted as you did if you wish to. There are 13 yeses, zero noes, and zero abstentions. Over to you, Dr. Morris. Thank you. So we'll go down the list and have everyone who voted uh, state their name and vote into the record. And uh, you can provide justification of your vote if you wish to. Uh, and uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Stud. Sorry, Eric Dr. Stud. I voted yes. Thank you, Dr. Richmond. I also voted yes. Uh, Dr. Amadon? Yes, this is uh, Greg Amadon. I voted yes. Thank you. Dr. Carrico? This is Jeff Carrico. I voted yes. Dr. Le Dr. Kelvin Lee? This is Calvin Lee. I, I voted yes with uh, with the understanding that, you know, this is a continued rollout of a pilot that has shown value and opportunity and where expansion seems reasonable. I, at the same time, I think it's going to be important um, to take into account uh, the need for regulatory convergence uh, instead of divergence, uh, which would otherwise undermine some of the benefits. And so I look forward to the agency continuing to work uh, with other agencies as well as the regulated industry to ensure that the gains that the agency receives in doing this, which I think uh, promise to be many, are also considered in the context of efficiency gains from other agencies as well as the regulated industry itself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and this is Kenneth Morris. I voted yes. Dr. Kagan? This is Leonard Kagan. I voted yes. Thank you, Dr. Sorry, Dr. Donovan. This is Maureen Donovan. I voted yes. Thank you, Dr. Feinstone. Uh, Sandra Feinstone. I voted yes with the caveat that uh, analysis uh, will be part of the process. Thank you, Dr. Tong Lai Lee. Uh, this is Tony Lee. I voted yes. Thank you, Dr. Kraft. This is Walter Kraft. I voted yes. I would like to encourage the FDA to publish and share any pre-competitive findings that arise from CASA in publications and, and presentations. And secondly, that the interests of non-commercial stakeholders be kept in mind during the development process. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good point. Dr. Zamboni? I voted yes as there is a clear benefit to the technology and that the tools will evolve over time. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I believe I summarized before I go on to the non-voting question. Is that uh, cor correct, Rhea? Can I jump in for William Hancock? I'm sorry? Hello, I just want to say William Hancock, I also voted yes. Oh, did I miss you? I apologize, Dr. Hancock. <laughs> Not at all, and I just wanted to say I believe this initiative is very important, particularly with the advent of new biological therapies. And so I look forward to the databases getting more and more enriched. Thank you. Apologies again. I've been up since quarter to five this morning in Arizona, so <laughs> my excuse. I, I understand the problem in California, too. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I, I believe I, I can summarize uh, some at this point, and then we'll summarize after the uh, non-voting question, too. Is that correct, Leo? Yes, Dr. Morris, that's correct. If you could please yeah. summarize before okay. we move to the discussion question, too. Yeah, so... The, uh, the summary, I mean, I, I think that the, it's, it's very clear that, there, that, that everybody is in agreement that the, the potential for CASA is, is very significant. 
uh, the the questions uh, are always uh, in the details, of course, which makes sense. And those include, uh, in broad categories, uh, ensuring the the veracity of the techniques that are used to, for the risk assessment, and also uh, not losing the experiential part of uh, reviewers' jobs, which are very valuable. Uh, and so making sure that translates into the, into the more structured uh, the structured filings. Uh, also, the uh, continued flexibility to handle different product complexity levels, and certainly as you get more into biologics, uh, there are concerns both from the committee and uh, other stakeholders uh, that the quality attributes be more fully defined uh, as time goes on, which is part of the uh, part of the plan, of course. Uh, sharing the, the techniques that are used, I think, will become more important as, uh, as they build. Uh, but I, and I think the inclusion of stakeholders that are not, not necessarily the pharma companies or the pharmaceutical companies uh, becomes important. Uh, to the to the committee, and as far as the, as the potential for uh, limitations, I think the uh, continued development uh, part of that was well enough explained that the committee uh, has uh, has understood that, as well as the wording of the question to to be inclusive uh, of the fact that this is an ongoing development uh, and uh, ultimately will will lead to not only benefits for the assessors, but uh, there's the cautionary tale of making sure that that's also a benefit that's realized by the by the companies and ultimately the public. And I, I, that, that was my summary of it, and I think the vote bears out those, uh, those uh, sum, sum, sorry, summarizing uh, uh, the topics. Okay, so uh, that being completed, we'll move on to question two, which is a discussion question. Um, I'll read the question. Uh, in the age of digitalization, what additional actions should the FDA take to realize cloud-based assessments? And the, as, as with the last question, uh, if there are any questions uh, or issues with the wording, uh, please raise your hand and we can uh, go through them as, uh, as we did in the last one. So I'm, I'm not seeing any hands. Am I missing anyone here? Yeah. I don't see any hands raised with the wording. Oh, Dr. Feinstone may have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed that. Dr. Feinstone, please. No, you didn't miss it. I just raised my hand. Um, I'm a little bit distressed that um, that analysis and valuation wasn't discussed uh, in the previous question. It, it seems to me that the emphasis is on uh, efficiency and not as much as perhaps I would like on outcomes. Is there any consideration or has the FDI considered utilizing this application with um, uh, projects or processes that have already been approved through the old method to see how they um, match up with each other? I, I don't know if that's possible or if it's even uh, a consideration or, or would be of any value, but I'm, again, I, I think I, and seeing some of the others that I'm concerned about evaluation not being a high priority. Well, let me, if I can interject, so you're actually talking about the vote that was already taken, though. Uh, you're not talking about discussion question two, or? Well, yes and no. Or is that? Yeah, what additional okay. decisions should the FDA take? And, and, Mine would be a, a more uh, robust evaluation. I think. Thank you. Yes, um, I I don't know if it's okay to um, to diverge for a minute, Rhea, but uh, 
I, I think there was in the presentations some um, use of the in the past studies of going to uh, uh, already approved products, but um, if if it's allowed, uh, Ray, can FDA comment? Well, the, the can this, this is Lawrence, and uh, absolutely, you know, this question basically open-ended the question. We're seeking any advice from the uh, members. So, Sanjay Feinstein, Dr. Sanjay Feinstein, certainly is good, good comments, and uh, you know, we certainly will take back any advice we receive from this committee, and uh, think about this and to see what we need to do. And uh, certainly, that that the reassessment of a low volume to our current system could be a good option for us to. For, uh, for us to take on. We certainly we have to look, uh, think of whether we develop a system or evaluate the older system, so we have to keep a balanced decision here. And uh, can hopefully the, I answer this question. I answered this question, sorry. Yes, I'm yeah. happy. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. 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 No, I was actually, uh, yeah, so we, we sort of, there were no questions on the wording, so we we're opening it up to general questions, so that's the only distinction I was making. Dr. Feinstein, Feinstein. Um, yeah. And are, are there any other questions? Uh, not necessarily uh, on the wording, uh, but uh, just uh, any other questions before we move on? All right. So I don't see I don't see any other questions, and, and le unless I've missed something, but I've gone down the list. And, Sorry. Dr. Cole may have a question as well. Yeah, this sorry, is uh, Fuller Kraft. So are you now opening it up for oh, discussion yes. on the discussion point, or are you soliciting questions about the clarity of the discussion point? I think it was the clarity of the discussion point okay. was, the, what was the wording here. So I was going to I was going to summarize that, that there's not a, a, a lot to summarize on discussion question two. We didn't really uh, hit on it uh, specifically during the, uh, the clarifying questions. Uh, indirectly, though, uh, again, we hit on, because it's cloud, there, were, there was mention of the security in the cloud and the, uh, the tools that are available in the cloud. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that uh, came out uh, uh, during the uh, overall discussion uh, was the idea of using Data, data analysis tools, uh, and in particular, uh, in the in the discussion in the presentations, there were talk of the data visualization tools, and I, I think uh, I think it was pretty well agreed that uh, the cloud tool uh, arsenal has uh, grown uh, incredibly quickly, and there are a lot of tools that are already available out there that uh, that FDA could uh, take advantage of. Uh, not necessarily for uh, risk assessment, uh, the, although perhaps that I was thinking that from our discussions that, that could be more for how it's presented both to the to the uh, sponsor uh, as well as uh, how it's used internally uh, by FDA. So uh, I think we're approaching uh, adjournment, unless I'm missing something. Rhea, is that correct? Dr. I just want to confirm, um, if there are no more questions about the wording of the discussion question, then we can move into discussion for discussion question two. Oh, we can? Oh, okay. I didn't know it was open. That was, I guess, your point, Dr. Kraft. Yeah. So now we're open for discussion, general discussion for the question. And so I sort of already uh, gave my opinion that the idea of uh, data visualization really needs to be uh, explored to, in order to take full advantage of the cloud uh, resources. And, and now there are others who have, uh, who have discussion uh, on the question. Please raise your hand and be recognized. And so Dr. Kraft, if you want, please uh, weigh in. Yeah, this is uh, Walter Kraft. I would just encourage as this is being built, um, to think through the potential for third-party uh, access to the data. Uh, uh, Patient-level data, HPI, 
um, is um, pretty mature in terms of privacy and the availability of third parties to access large health system data. Um, and I would just encourage that obviously there are competitive uh, imperatives, but that, again, at the time of creation or formation, having the foresight to think about the ability of, to share to third parties uh, de-identified data would allow, uh, you know, I think a great resource for all parties. Thank you. Thank you. No, good point. Uh, I don't know if FDA has any comments, but uh, for the rest of us on the panel as well, make sure uh, any advice to FDA, I'm sure, would be gladly uh, would be welcomed. So. Ken, do you want to come? Do, do you want us comments, or maybe we just summarize all the recommendations from this committee? Yes, please. Yeah, so for, you know the, the I think our the, the purpose of this question is we collect all the recommendations, comments from the committee, then the within FDA we could look at all the recommendations and then prioritize which action we're gonna take on. So maybe it's probably a, a little bit challenge for us to make a comment yes or no this moment here. Oh right, right. Right. Thank you. So are Dr. there advice? Yeah, I go believe ahead. Blood has his hand raised as well. Oh, okay. I don't see that. Thank you, Dr. Slug. Yes, so this is Eric Slug. Uh, I'm responding uh, partly to this uh, suggestion about data visualization and other tools. I'm primarily a statistician, so uh, of course uh, all data analytic and machine learning tools should be in scope. But I'd like to make the comment that uh, in, in this kind of uh, environment, the usefulness of those tools is uh, to a large extent based on the response data of what it is you want those predictive tools to be able to imitate and predict. And so the, in this environment, the, the true responses that you're trying to get at are what humans would have evaluated as um, high and low risks and, and which variables um, contribute to them. So in, in that sense, the FDA would uh, possibly want to consider um, additional human assessments to add to this cloud-based database that could be used in the mining and model fitting and uh, machine learning associated with letting the analytic tools uh, do that work. Uh, uh, of course, the regulatory decisions will be uh, data that are routinely collected and, and presumably made part of the cloud database, but there could be other interim uh, risk decisions that could, in a separate data collection from human experts, um, be of use in, in making these uh, uh, th these analytic tools um, more productive. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I believe now, I've, actually, I can see the hands now. So, uh, Dr. Amadon? Yeah, yes, yeah. This is Greg Amadon, University of Michigan. Uh, the, the, question, the comments, uh, I think, that you made, uh, Dr. Morris, regarding security, I, I think is, is certainly important. Uh, I appreciated the comments uh, also related to uh, third-party access um, that can certainly uh, facilitate the, the further advancement of, of CASA. Uh, in terms of, you know, cloud-based cloud uh, assessment, uh, my thought is that, that that could easily facilitate uh, perhaps uh, uh, global registrations and speed the development and approval process. So maybe think globally in terms of, of constructing uh, this, this system. Uh, and uh, I guess related to that is the, the multi-directional communication that this uh, could allow. Uh, between companies, between FDA, or between uh, other regulatory agencies, 
um, could could all be uh, uh, perhaps integrated into this uh, this cloud cloud based assessment. Um, thank you. Thank you, Greg. And uh, so, Dr. Dr. Morris, I want to. This is Alana. I want to make one comment, yes, if please. you don't mind. No, no, please. I want to make one comment related to security because uh, uh, I want to let everybody know. Probably, certainly, uh, the CNC information is uh, uh, there's a lot of proprietary information. Uh, for example, drug product formulation, so on and so forth. So when we discuss this, the uh, develop this CASA. And in fact, our security is the highest security possible, equivalent to military. Just so let let the public know, and and the our CMC CASA system is sitting on much higher secure. Let's put that one much secure than probably the rest, uh, the other the discipline of the FDA. So and so it's pretty much as secure as 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 the military. Just so let everybody know, and uh, frankly, this because of the high security. The deliver costs have been delayed for several months because of the requirement. So just to let the uh, let the members and and the, and the public know that the costs are sitting on the very high. We call the fifth mile high security, as high as about like a military uh, the operation. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Is it as high as Facebook though? No comments here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, Dr. Tong Lai Li. Uh, thank you, Ken. Uh, this is Tong Lai Li from Purdue University. Um, I think one of the things the, uh, uh, Lawrence mentioned in his talk is uh, deep learning and AI. And they, uh, so we have been working on the deep learning over the last few years. Uh, one of the things uh, we think is very important is data. So, um, you know, the quality of data and, uh, and um, you know, number of data can really affect uh, the the quality of the deep learning model. So uh, I'm really glad, actually, uh, I just support Dr. Kraft's question about uh, you know data sharing and maybe the open the data uh, for for uh, not all the data, but uh, some data that can allow the public to uh, maybe validate or develop a, a similar deep learning methods. So again, I just want to. Uh, support uh, a previous question by Dr. Kraft. Thank you, thank you. And uh, Dr. Slavi, is your uh, name, is your hand up? Uh, yes, it is. I would like also to weigh in on this issue of uh, of privacy. Uh, from my perspective, involved with state, uh, Census Bureau work, um, we found that uh, it's surprising the extent to which uh, large databases of apparently de-identified data can be re-identified. So that the problem of uh, making databases that contain proprietary information really secure from the point of view of uh, re-identification of, of the parties and the information involved is not trivial at all. It is not obvious that you will be able to share very widely without uh, extensive additional consent by the Submitters by the sponsors. Yeah, that's very interesting and valuable. Yes. Yeah. And Dr. Dr. Lee Tonglai, do you have your hand up again? No, it's down. Okay. Okay, I was just uh, checking. So let me re-summarize a little bit um, for for FDA. Um, there's a, so, sort of a double-edged uh, recommendation that data be made, uh, cloud data be made available outside uh, to uh, sort of raise all boats, if you will, in terms of access to these for modeling and and other uh, activities. On the other hand, as we just heard, uh, it's pretty difficult to de-identify data reliably. Uh, so uh, I'm sure that uh, within the agency, that's a caution that's already being uh, uh, discussed, if not observed. Uh, also, the uh, idea that 
multi -communi multi directional communication is very important. Uh, that is between the FDA and stakeholders. Uh, and I would say the stakeholders, particularly given what we've been talking about the last two days, uh, become even it becomes even more important as we talk about uh, the whole the whole uh, meeting discussion. And then with respect to the tools that are used, uh, the uh, cloud-based tools, uh, both in the agency and outside agency, visualization tools to rapidly get a, a feel for the way things are, hand, are handled uh, is really a, a growing area and, and really very, a very fertile area for discussion and uh, development. So I think, uh, let me just go back to the script. I've missed a page, but so uh, at this point, uh, now now am I right, uh, Rhea, that we're looking uh, at uh, wrapping up? Yes. For adjournment? To, yeah, we good. Can okay. Comments from the FDA. Yes, that's what I was saying. So FDA, uh, any comments before we uh, yeah, go push on to mine. Well, uh, this is Lawrence, and I want to thank you, Ken. Thank you for providing leadership. Yeah, also, thank you for your time and effort. I want to thank all the members for your time and effort to join us for two days, especially today. You know, I also want to thank all the FDA speakers and panelists that to provide our comments. So certain information, voting, and the information provided in, in extremely valuable to us. And FDA is, uh, will take back your recommendations and certainly prioritize some of the action. We will assure you that the time you spend is worthwhile to not only to the public, certainly to the FDA, to industry as well. So I want to take this opportunity to thank all of you for your time and effort. And uh, thank you, the Chair, the, Dr. Ken Mollis, for, the, for your leadership. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and I'll, I just want to echo, uh, I thought the, uh, the the presentations were amazing. These last two days have been uh, very exciting. The, uh, the amount of change that this uh, could bring to the uh, whole process is, is uh, as I said, pretty amazing. Uh, yet it's being done in such a way that uh, hopefully everybody not only sees the value, but uh, will have a smoother transition than, uh, than they probably think they will as they go to this. Uh, I think the, uh, the idea that with CASA in particular being the logical evolution of the way uh, the agencies, the agency and the agencies internationally are trying to evolve the safety and efficacy and quality of drug products uh, is, uh, is pretty impressive. Uh, and uh, the panels for a lively discussion both both days uh, is amazing, and uh, I don't think uh, anybody has any extra time. But we certainly appreciate all of the effort that goes into prepping and and uh, participating in these uh, events. Uh, and uh, I want a special thanks to Beth Wables and her and her team, especially Ray Abat and and Joanna Malsh and the other FDA staff for organizing a very successful a couple of days. I've been doing this for about 20 years now, and uh, uh, the level to which we depend upon the FCA staff is, uh, is uh, also pretty amazing. So uh, without uh, any other comments from the uh, agency or Rhea, uh, I'll, I'll, we can adjourn the meeting now, I believe. Is that correct, Rhea? Yes, thank you so much, Dr. I, I don't no, thank you. I, I don't do anything without her okay, so. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, and we'll, we'll now adjourn the meeting. And uh, for those of us on the West Coast uh, this afternoon and everybody else, uh, have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The meeting is now 